Okay, ladies and gentlemen, here we go. Welcome to the Board of Selectmen's meeting for Monday, March 21st, 2016. Item number one on the agenda for approval, the farmer's market, Patsy Kramer, the market manager. Yes. Hi. Don't Hi, have enough to do. Patsy, welcome. Hi. I'm here to officially request that you give us permission to have the 19th uh, Arlington Farmer's Market in the municipal parking lot. We uh, hold the Farmer's Market every Wednesday starting the second Wednesday in June, going through the last Wednesday in October from 2 to 6.30. We are anchored with six uh, produce farmers, a meat a vendor, chicken vendor, um, uh, fish chowder and fish smoked fish and two cheese vendors, two wine vendors, bread and pastry, prepared foods, honey, pasta, and a knife sharpener. Um, as you recall, uh, last, the last two years we had a program of a, a parking permit pass because of all the difficulties with the machines and I'm told by Mr. Kuro that he hears from the parking guys that the machines, the new machines are working really well and that you would like us to try to see if that continues to work well through the farmer's market, which certainly makes sense to me. And then if there are a lot of complications, I'll come back and talk to you. Did you mention a beer and wine vendor in there? Two, two wine vendors. Two wine vendors, yes. okay. Uh -huh. Yeah. That'll be coming. Any discussion, questions? Yeah, Dan. Uh, move approval, and I'll say just, I'll, I'll second, I, I hadn't brought it up beforehand, but I had a similar uh, reaction about the parking was that I thought that the <coughs> parking we did the last couple of years was made a lot of sense when those machines were in such disrepair, yeah. but I'm really hopeful that the new ones go forward, so I'm mm -hmm. delighted to support the market uh, for another year. Great. Second. Did you second? Okay. I, I didn't yet. I'll but. second the motion and uh, <clears throat> also just say yeah, <clears throat> thank you very much for all the work you put into this. It's always uh, much uh, looked forward to. And uh, uh, just as a side, I understand, do I understand correctly that someone in your organization has a birthday today? Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> so happy birthday. That would be me. <laughs> happy birthday, Pat. Happy birthday oh. to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Patsy. Happy birthday to you. I don't look nearly as old as I really am, right? <laughs> thank you for doing this. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Green, and thank you, uh, Patsy. I, I, I'm also going to support this, but I, I do think that um, now, as we're kind of going through a, you know, parking strategy for the center, that um, it, this is going to be, I think, the, you know, when we consider the allocation of parking spots, you know, it, it gets pretty full, filled up in there. And I don't know if, uh, certainly not this year, but I think, you know, down the line, um, you know, it might be worth considering potentially other places to hold the farmer's market. Um, you know, I think that we certainly have to kind of see what the turnover is with the new um, parking scheme. But I, I think it's just something I, um, I wanted to put on everyone's radar um, for the time being. And um, maybe we can start to brainstorm about that moving forward. But um, I, that nothing imminent. I just want to uh, you know, put that out there and say that we are looking at the different turnover and how the lot is used currently. And, you know, as Patsy knows and others, we have talked about other locations for the farmer's market before. Uh, but it continues to get more popular and more popular, and it's, yeah. it's mm -hmm. taken a good part of that uh, whole parking uh, area. So mm -hmm. anyhow, I'm more than glad to brainstorm on it. Yeah, mm -hmm. Joe? Thank you. I'm sorry. To, to, yeah, to Mr. Burns' point, actually, I think it is important that we note that, that we do have two other um, activities that I think are going to be contending for some of the parking space closest to, to uh, Jefferson Cutter House this season as well. I know, I think the work is going to be taking place on the house, isn't it, over this, yes, this summer? And so we did approve using a couple of those parking spots as a staging area for that construction. Mm. And um, if I'm not mistaken, the, the um, safe travel project in the center is also using a little bit of that space. So, so that's a further agenda item. And... The, in the Russell Common Lot, it would be overnight space, so it shouldn't have an impact. Uh, but there is some spaces in the railroad lot they want to use during the day, so it shouldn't impact farmers' yeah, just, just to keep okay. that on the radar. Good. Great. Thank you. 
Okay. Thank you. All those in favor, please, on the, on the motion by Mr. Dunn, seconded by Mr. Curo, please signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed. Okay. And I should have asked, any of you here wishing to speak on this? <laughs> it's too late. No. <laughs> thank you very much. Sorry. Thank you, Patsy. Happy birthday. Thank you. And finally drink. Why don't you go out and have a cocktail? <laughs> Consent agenda, the minutes of the meeting for February 22nd, 2016, and then we have a request for one day beer and wine license for April 9th for the Arlington Center for the Arts Theater, 41 Foster Street for Blues Apocalypse. Uh, first of all, anybody, uh, any comments on the minutes of the meeting from February 22nd? Mr. Uh, Kiro. Uh, thank you very much. I did um, <clears throat> talk, talk to the office, I, I think on the the vote re regarding the mar medical marijuana dispensary, um, the minutes did reflect that we voted um, a letter of support, but I, I believe it's correct that we voted a letter of non-opposition. So I, I did transmit that to the office. But I think it's called that support non-opposition, non isn't it? That's what they kept saying that night. It's either support or non-opposition. Oh, it's either. Okay. So yeah, we agreed to non-opposition. Oh, non I, I agree. Okay. And is Carol here from the Arlington Center for the Arts? Anybody here from the Arlington Center for the Arts wishing to speak on that matter? Yeah. Am I seeing a hand in the back? Is there, is there a hand up in the back? Yeah, yes. Barbara. Okay. Yeah. Hi, I'm Barbara Costa. I'm on the board of the Arlington Center for the Arts. I had no idea I was going to speak on this, but <laughs> seeing that Carol's not here, I could certainly answer any questions. It's a one-day event. It's a big fundraiser for the center. And as you know, we need all the money we can get these days. And so um, we did this Blues Apocalypse last year. It was very successful. And uh, we're looking forward to hosting it again April 9th. So I don't know if you need to know anything specifically, legally, about this request for the license. but. Well, just for the millions watching at home, Barbara. Yeah, they, we they, hope they, you'll all buy yeah. tickets in advance. You right. go to the How Arlington Center for the Arts website. So, say it again. Go to the Arlington Center for the Arts website to be able to purchase tickets in advance. Okay. And we hope to see everybody there. Thank okay. you. Okay, thank you. Uh, on motion on the uh, consent agenda. Move, approval. Approval. Move approval. Second. Approval. Seconded. Further discussion. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed. Appointments, newly appointed Open Space Committee member, Kelsey Cowan. Oh. <laughs> they spelled it for me uh, phonetically here. So. <laughs> Kelsey, think. welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much for your willingness to uh, serve on this Open Space Committee. Why are you willing to serve <laughs> on the Open Space Committee? Um, well, I graduated in May from Mount Holyoke College um, with a degree in physics and coastal marine science, was interested in getting a job in the environmental industry sector um, with limited success, so I reached out to the Conservation Commission initially to do some volunteer work for them, um, and then they assigned me with a gigantic project <laughs> on my first meeting there, which was awesome. Um, but it ended up being outside of the scope of their work, so the Open Space Committee adopted it, and therefore me, and now I'm a member. Well, you're about to be a member. I'm about to be a member, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Thank you for being there so long. <laughs> we really appreciate that. Mm -hmm. but, uh, questions, comments, Mr. Dunn? Uh, delighted. Thank you very much. My pleasure. No, I, I think Ms. Cowan is correct, though. Didn't we not appoint her last time, but we asked her. Oh, that's what it is. I'm <laughs> sorry. Sorry. <laughs> Putting me on the hot sorry, seat right. here. Yeah. yeah, but we do ask uh, for new appointments to committees. If they can't come the night of the appointment, we do ask that they come eventually. So thank you for doing that. Mm -hmm. And you're right. You're already on. So you know what? I, re I retract my question. You don't have to answer it. How would you do it? <laughs> Stephen, anything else? No, thank you very really, much. Thank you very much, Kelsey. Thank good, you. Good for you. All Take right, care. thanks. I am off to a roaring start here. Licenses <laughs> and permits. Request of a common victuallers and wine and malt license for Mashed. Doing business as Otto, 202 Mass Avenue. Anthony W. Allen and Michael Keown. Just one here tonight, Anthony Allen. Hi. Hello. I'm just going for my CV this evening, not um, the wine and malt. Oh, just the victuallers? Yes. Okay. Um, so yeah, talk to. Yeah. He's not going for the wine and yet because he has to get the rest of the papers into us, so he'll be hopefully ready 
for April 4th. Oh, you're going yes. to be going for it. Okay. Correct. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, questions from the board? No. No? Anybody want to make a motion? I move approval, and um, I can now walk to um, Otto, which I'm very excited about. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Happy to be here. <laughs> Second. Yeah. Yes. So I just uh, so I'm curious. Uh, I read a little bit, and it said you know, te this is your tenth location. Is that right? Eleventh. Yeah. Eleventh. Oh, okay. Yep. And and also the New Hampshire, Massachusetts. Is that right? No, New Hampshire. Uh, six up in Portland, and five in Mass. Okay. I live in Newburyport. My business partner Mike lives up in Portland. Okay. Yeah. Cool. So, yeah. Thank happy you. to be here. Terrific location uh, uh, in the Capitol Theater building. Really excited. Great. Uh, Samples of the food? Uh, they were here. Uh, <laughs> next meeting. All right. Well, when you come back for the wine and malt beer, you know what I'll be asking. <laughs> uh, okay, so is there a motion? Uh, yes. Uh, they just did, sorry. A motion uh, and seconded. Mr. Second. Really? Yeah. I actually see a raised hand in the audience, surprisingly. Yep, one second. Okay. So uh, moved and seconded, subject to all the conditions as set forth, sir. Gentleman doesn't know me. I'm Jeff Boudreau. I live in Arlington, and I know that his reputation precedes him. There's an excellent professor of mandolin playing at Berkeley College of Music who plays in his shop in Portland on Tuesday nights, and I hope that he does the same here. Joe Walsh. We'll break him down. Welcome to Arlington. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. So will there be an open mic night for us uh, singers? Um, I don't think I have that in the application, so <laughs> uh, we'll do it quietly. Like tones, maybe? <laughs> <laughs> Okay, anybody else wishing to speak on this? Okay, on the motion, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed. Thank you very much for choosing Arlington. Best Thank of you. luck. Thank you so when much. When do you hope to open? Um, early May, hopefully. Okay, great. Good luck. Thank you. Thank you. So, traffic rules and orders, the Arlington Commission on Arts and Culture. Barbara Costa, come on back up. And Stephanie, is Stephanie also? Yep, sure. Hello again. Um, Stephanie and I would like to give our annual report since we um, are charged to uh, keep in touch with you about all matters, arts, and culture. And actually, you should tell us what's on your mind as well. But just very briefly, because I know you have a lot this evening. Um, we've accomplished a number of things this past year. I'll report very briefly. Both of us will report on it. The whole cultural district designation process is underway. Uh, we started last April with a meeting at the Old Schwan Mill. We had a, a really packed room, a lot of different organizations um, in town interested in how, uh, in the application to the Mass, uh, Mass Cultural Council for the designation of a district um, in, uh, in town, and we are um, in the middle of applying to that right now. We um, will, we have, uh, we have basically put a uh, preliminary uh, description of, an, of a district which would run from the um, Arlington Center, kind of near Lake Street, Mill Street area, down into East Arlington. Um, it, it needs to be walkable. The Mass Cultural Council will decide if it's walkable, but it also needs to include uh, historical cultural um, locations and um, have it be a place that ultimately uh, we will enliven with more activities, with signage, and it'll be on website, the statewide website. It'll be a really good way to bring Arlington on the tourism map and also to enliven it for um, the community itself. So that's the general idea. We have a managing partnership of many organizations that have come together, and part of the excitement is that groups are coming together, working together. It'll help in um, grant writing later. It'll uh, it'll just help um, to uh, gather ideas about ways to, uh, synergies, I guess, that we could have among various groups. Um, and I guess there are many, too many to mention, but um, include the, the primary ones who are organizing this managing partnership, because we, as an umbrella organization, the Commission on Arts and Culture, are making sure this is happening, but um, there are other groups that are running this application and that's the town libraries, the, Arlington, uh, the uh, Center for the Arts, Arlington Center for the Arts, and the Chamber of Commerce, and many other groups which we've listed. Um, so the, um, that's in process. Um, and then the public art inventory we did this summer, working with an intern, Will Sullivan, uh, did a lot to get an online um, version of what's, what's in town 
in terms of, and you should help me here, mm -hmm. Stephanie, uh, art, three-dimensional art, st you know, st uh, statues, um, and a lot of information on each, including, uh, well, anyway, it's in a database that we will continue to add to. Is there, mm -hmm. yeah, is that pretty much done? Yeah, it's on our website. It's not 100% done, but right. it covers, you know, about 80 to 90% of what we have, and we'll, we'll come back and hopefully finish that, you know, maybe this summer or other during vacation times. Um, but yeah, it covers indoor and outdoor public art, mm -hmm. so you might want to take a look And our at website, that. again, is the, well, through the town website, the Commission on Arts and Culture, but we also have our own um, page, which is arlingtoncac.com. So uh, I will do that, but I'm just curious, what number of, of mm, do you remember? what was the total number inventory of public the art? total number inventory, that is well, a just curious. great I question. I want ballpark? I, ballpark 35. Okay. No. Yeah, Mr. Actually, John? on the same topic, so I actually, I read the, uh, the packet and I actually went online to look for the, the inventory oh, did you? and I actually couldn't find it. So if you could give oh, me dear. more direction or navigation, I'd appreciate it. Yes. Like I found like the the website and it's got like the circles with All the, the circles. Yes. and yes. I click and one of the circles was public art yeah. and I clicked on that and it had a blog post but I still couldn't find the, that wasn't where that inventory was because it was something like that last time I <laughs> so so I will check uh, up on that I, yeah. very, I was very interested in to find that one yes okay we'll okay. make sure that that's uh, more okay. obvious then. Yes. Um, and then uh, we'll be doing a, uh, well, no, in, this is reporting what we've done already, um, that we have been uh, on, the, on the idea of a town-wide cultural plan. Um, we have met and discussed potential scopes with um, one of our, um, uh, 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 Lillian Shu at the Cambridge Arts Council, one of our advisors. We've also spoken to some other uh, um, people who do run cultural plans, who organize um, cultural planning, just to get a sense of the budget. And we have um, been applying for funding to help that process through the Metropolitan Area Planning Commission. Um, we're waiting to hear on that, by the way. Um, anything more on the cultural plan, planning process from last year that we've mm -hmm. done? No, we really, we really decided, you know, that that some of the some of the numbers were quite large, and so really the Metropolitan Area Planning Council seemed to be the best approach because they, um, you, we do have to provide a match, but a lot of it is in kind, and then they provide a consultant who, um, who helps to put together the public meetings and all the data and. Uh, pull together a cultural plan. So it is still in two phases, and it is, um, um, we do, but we do think that that will be the most cost effective and also makes the most sense because Ted Fields has already been working with the Metropolitan Area Planning Cultural Co um, Council on the Arts and Culture Toolkit, and also our new planning director is from Massachusetts, you know, Metropolitan Area Planning Culture. So we have, we're waiting well. to hear on that. Why don't you yeah. continue with other things that happened last year? Okay. Right. So, um, well, arts advocacy, um, we understand that the ACA, you know, is in a transitional year, and so we've just been trying to support them in any way that we can. We've attended a lot of their meetings. Um, we've, we've written letters on their behalf, and so we're just here to support that because that's part of our job, advocate for arts and culture, and we want to make sure that the ACA ends up with a suitable home. Um, after all this process um, you know, ends. Um, and then we also were aware that there were a lot of different public art. There's so much energy around public art in town and there's so many initiatives happening. There's the Capitol Square um, the banner on the, on, the, um, on the Capitol Theater and then there's the banners, the youth banner project that was happening and also Cecily Miller's projects in East Arlington. So we again as the umbrella organization wanted to make sure that those efforts were being coordinated and that, you know, since we have Arlington Public Art and we have um, the Capitol Square and other people doing things, we just wanted to make sure that everyone was aware and that they were also aware of the larger cultural district project and the goals of the cultural district and the need for us to fill in the space more between East Arlington and Arlington Center in order to be able to qualify for that, that district, um, that, which is rather large by their standards, but they have, 
given us the okay to pursue that district being from East Arlington all the way up through Arlington Center on the um, condition that we think through how to make um, that feel more continuous for people. And cohesive. Mm. Yeah. Um, okay, so now our goals for the next year are to facilitate a successful application for the cultural district designation through the MCC and um, the next step in that process is to have a public input meeting which will happen on March 30th. March 30th, 7 o'clock at the ACA. You are all invited. We do hope that you attend. Everyone in this room, everyone on this board and we'll be brainstorming those, ideas at home, watching at home. We'll be brainstorming ideas for things that could possibly, you could even, places you've been around the world that you thought they were really fascinating and they were doing a certain thing and could it happen here? I mean, anything like that and as well as talking about Arlington's specific offerings and what would be exciting to have um, featured in a cultural district. So right. it's really a great, important time. It's part of our application process, but it's also a great opportunity from, for everyone to really come in and, and be part of that vision right. process. It's so. a visioning meeting. Yeah. yeah. And then um, the next step will be for the Board of Selectmen to pass a resolution. Um, and then with we expect to come to you in about a month, within a month. Right. We have to have the public meeting first. We have to sift through everything. And then when we're ready to present the application, we, the last step will be the resolution that needs to come from the board. Yep. And then um, we, we, have, we got your blessing, or well, I guess it has to pass through town meeting. Um, to add two more members, so we want to strengthen our capacity because we have been very busy. We spoke to you about that last time we were here. Mm -hmm. um, and then to um, hopefully be success successful with that cultural plan application with the Metropolitan Area Planning Council, we have another opportunity to apply in June for a diff slightly different grant but with the same organization, um, and we've been encouraged to do that, so hopefully between one or two or both we will be able to start that. We'll look anywhere for funding, process. right? <laughs> yep. And then uh, could just continue to advocate for arts and culture in town. So that's our mission. That's what we do. So is there anything else you would like us to be doing that should come um, <laughs> up in our c coming year? You're allowed to I, tell I us. I think later your plates are full. <laughs> Myself, but anything else? No. Anybody? Joe. I mean, this is a very active and proactive commission. It's very hard to believe that you've only been together for three years. Um, <clears throat> tell you the truth, I mean, you actually, I was going to give you a throw and you already uh, put in a plug. I think it is very important um, that there be good community representation at the March 30th um, public input session for the cultural district. It's a very important initiative and I think <clears throat> the commission members have done just a great job of bringing together the, the um, you know, public and private and nonprofit sectors in town to, to really sit at the same table to push this initiative. Um, you know, as they mentioned, the libraries, the Chamber of Commerce, ACA, are kind of uh, leading it, but it was all facilitated really through the commission's work. So uh, thank you for that, and we'll look forward to seeing you um, when, when it comes time for us to look at what the results of all that public input was and for this board to potentially adopt a resolution to allow the application to go forward to the state. Thanks, and thanks for all your support. Yes. Thank you. Exactly. So I think it's a motion to receive, right? So moved. Second. Second. Further discussion? All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed. Great job. Pleasure. Thank, thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, I should mention our, our fifth member, uh, Ms. Mahan, uh, is at another event, but she will be joining us shortly. Uh, so, Article 7, Item 7 for approval, Center Safe Travel Project, request for use of parking spaces, Mr. Chapter Lane. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, so you have before you an email from J.J. Phelan Company, the contractor that will be working on the Arlington Center Safe Travel Project. They are requesting uh, use of six spaces at the railroad lot adjacent to the Uncle, uh, yeah, the Uncle Sam Plaza and the uh, Tourism uh, Center uh, for storage space during the construction project. And they're also looking to use four spaces for overnight parking of equipment in the Russell Common lot. Uh, I know the town engineer ha has really worked this through with them, and we think this is the least impactful space usage that they can, uh, they can use. Uh, I'll also quickly note, uh, mentioned the last meeting, but I'll mention again, this Wednesday, March 23rd, 7 p.m. here in Town Hall, we're having a public information session to really talk to people about the project and 
what it's going to be like during construction, uh, but would appreciate the board's positive action on this tonight. Okay. Move approval. Move approval. S second. Second. Sorry. Yep. Discussion, comments, yep. So what one question. Um, this, this did come up, um, I was with the center merchants this week, and the question was, this is only regarding parking spaces. One of the questions was um, asked about some of the uh, uses that this board already approved this summer for the Jefferson Cutter lawn. Um, there, there won't be any uh, need for, for the lawn for staging. Yeah, I, I, I heard that. I think there may have been a misunderstanding. Uh, there'll be some work at that corner to improve okay. the, um, the, uh, the ramp, the curb ramp. Yeah. Uh, but I, there should be no need to utilize the Jefferson Cutter lawn. lawn. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay. Further discussion? Anybody here to speak on this? All those in favor of the motion by Mr. Byrne, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed. Item 8, for approval, authorization to draft an RFP for the sale of 1207 Mass Avenue. Adam. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, so as the board recalls, it had authorized uh, me in cooperation with the town council to issue an RFP for the short-term lease of the building, uh, formerly the DAV, located at 1207 Mass Ave, for the potential use as a co-working space or some kind of collaborative space. Uh, we had put it out to bid. Uh, and did not receive uh, any successful bids. We did receive some feedback that it was a short time frame and that a lot of investment would have been needed to be put into the building. I think those were things that we had publicly discussed uh, here at prior meetings of the board, so I don't think the, that shouldn't have been much of a surprise to potential bidders. Uh, that said, the outcome was no bidders. Uh, I think the board also knows that at the special town meeting earlier this year, included in the financing plan or the funding plan for the Stratton renovation project, were the expected proceeds of up to a million dollars from the liquidation or sale of this building. So what I'm asking for from the board tonight is authorization for me to cooperate with town council and the director of planning and community development to draft an RFP uh, with the only criteria that I'm asking for is a, a, a floor price of $750,000 uh, to put into the RFP. And then if there's any other criteria the board would like to see included, we can, we can discuss those. I talked with some local, um, some local uh, people in the, in the real estate business. They think that is a fair floor without us doing a full-blown uh, further appraisal to update the appraisal we performed several years ago. Uh, I hesitated to put a million dollars as a floor uh, in that if we didn't receive any competitive bids, we'd have to start the process all over again. Yeah, Joe. I was wondering, legally, um, when we receive bids on the property, are we obligated to take the highest bid, or does this board um, also have some discretion over the perceived community benefit um, any proposals for the use? So it would depend if we actually utilized an RFP where we could put in comparative criteria, mm -hmm. or if we just actually issued an invitation for bid. Got it. You're asking for an RFP. Well, so I, you know, I, I, I called it an RFP because I think we'd want to put in uh, at least some qualifications for bidders, some, you yeah. know, being able to support that they can actually purchase and back up what they would offer. Sure. But if there's some other comparative criteria the board wants to recommend, I'd be happy to draft it and then bring it back for the board's consideration. Thank you. Oh, Steve, I think was next. Yeah. Um, sure. Thanks. I um. So I just want to say I um. I think that this was a good process that we went through for it. Um, I, I think it was pretty. Um, uh, comprehensive and I think um, what I'm not surprised that um, you know there weren't any respondents to the lease I think um, with the co-working space opening up right down the street uh, that definitely had something to do with it and um, I, I, I think that you know now with the you know move to sell I, I think it's probably will reap a you know a, a more positive long-term um, solution to this property as opposed to potentially leasing it out for a shorter term. So I'm, um, I'm happy with it. So thank you. Okay, Dan? I think one of the things we talked about before if we put this up for sale would be the possibility that other places on that block would want to go and, uh, and there might be benefits realized there. Do, does the town, I just, and this isn't something we do every day. Would we talk to those neighbors? Would we invite them into that process? Would we, uh, you know, work with people who are interested in the property to, to is there a fit role for us to play? In that kind of facilitation or no? Uh, I think there could be a role uh, for the planning department in that regard. I can say the two abutters uh, both have actively reached out to me with 
interest in when the town was going to be putting this building up for uh, for sale. So that's there's a good sign. Certainly local localized interest in it. Yeah. Okay. Joe. Okay. So we're starting at 750, but the real estate people you talk to, you feel pretty confident we will achieve the, the, the mill? I, I, no, I, I, no, to be clear, no. I, I didn't get that kind of feedback, but the feedback I received was that 750 would be a reasonable floor. Yeah. I mean, my goal is to, you know, suggest that we are trying, that the town is trying to, you know, get some financial benefits from this without going through a process that doesn't receive any, any bidders and have to reset the process. Okay. Yep. Speaking of Mrs. Mahan. I'm sorry. Do we all get one? Yeah. <laughs> and my car was too far away. To or only the chairman may have. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so uh, was there a motion here? Sorry. No. Anybody want to make one? I move that we go forward as uh, described by the town manager to create an RFP for the property with a floor of 750000 Second. Second. So uh, I'm just curious. We can't, uh, is this most likely someone's gonna purchase and tear down? I, I would think so, but I, I don't wanna claim Given to the location. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Um, the R All right. for the so, uh, so Diane, we're on article uh, number eight, okay, uh, the LDIV. Oh, okay, thank you. Do you wanna no, no. ask any questions or anything you all said? So what we're Adam about today. to do is authorize Adam to go out with an RFP. All right, all those in favor, please signify. Oh, is anybody here on this matter? All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 All those op uh, opposed. So, uh, you said aye? aye. Mm -hmm. Yep, okay, 5 and 0. 5 0, Marie. Uh, uh, number nine, for approval medical marijuana dispensary community benefit agreement, Adam Chapdelaine and Doug Heim. So, I, I will briefly say before turning it over to town council, when the board voted, it's uh, letter of non-opposition. It also stated that the letter of non-opposition was subject to the uh, successful negotiation of a uh, community benefit agreement. Uh, town Council's been working on that. We don't have a final community benefit agreement for the board's consideration tonight, but he does have an update to provide. Okay. Mr. Chairman, we've been in negotiations with Council for the RMD applicant. They've agreed in principle to add the uh, provisions that we wanted to see that would sort of provide us some more sort of safeguards and give us some assurance that we're going to get all the information that we want and need from them uh, going forward. So it's really just a matter of this t point in time, us ironing out the exact language of how that will fit into the agreement. And um, I don't want to say anything until the ink is dry on it, but I, I think that we've got the terms that uh, the selectmen want, and it's just a matter of us getting, coming to an agreement on the language. So no vote on this at this time? No. no. Okay. Questions from the board? Okay. 10, discussion, proposition two and a half. I apologize for being a uh, touch behind the discussion. Um, my name is Matt Schofield. I'm a pediatrician at 5 Water Street. It, uh, it came to me through my office that there's been some discussion of using the building at 511 Water Street as the site for a dispensary. Mm -hmm. uh, I just would appreciate if someone could kind of speak about where you are in terms of uh, talking about sites and whether this is a, considered a viable site or how you would um, go about the process of choosing a site. Okay. Uh, we obviously have a vested interest in this process. <laughs> I understand, yes. So all we have done, this board, is we have issued a, a letter of what's called non-opposition they have convinced us at this point that they're far enough along in the process. But I believe what you want to do is wait until they go before the redevelopment board, although, Doug, you might want to. That is where, right? No, you know. not necessarily. I mean, it, per perhaps. Um, I'm, I'm not sure of the full extent and nature of your concerns. I'd be happy to talk to you more about it offline. But this matter was, you know, before the selectmen several times, they have proposed a specific site. As far as we know, as of the time when we heard it, and right now, it's a viable site under the uh, Department of Public Health regulations. This is the Water Street site? This is the Water Street site. If there are, um, 
there is additional process that has to go through DPH and potentially uh, once there's a special permit hearing um, with the ARB. But I, I don't think that necessarily speaks to your concerns about its general viability. When we're talking about oh. security measures that might be in place. No, um, it's, more, it's more the regulations around uh, that such a facility has to be at least 1,000 feet from a school, for example, and yet this building has both a family practice office and a pediatric office. So we still we do have on the order of 120 children passing through the facility every single day. Uh, although we are not the size of a school, we are quite a substantial uh, site for childhood activity. Uh, seems entirely inappropriate that a building with a heavy pediatric uh, presence would be considered for this purpose. So as I said, I'm, I'd be happy to talk to you more about it, but the regulations are 500 feet, and there is a definition by DPH about what qualifies as, a, as what can be within that 500-foot zone and what can't. And as I said, I'd be happy to talk more about it. It hasn't been our understanding um, through uh, the various offices in town that have vetted it that there was a location within that 500-foot buffer zone, but I would be happy to talk more about it if there's any concern, because as I said, there's additional process to be had, but the selectman's letter of uh, non-opposition was based on the understanding from our town departments that there was not a site within that 500-foot radius. And so okay, we can talk about it more. Okay, has this been, uh, I mean, I presume that this was something that was either sought or approved by the landlord in the building? I, I can't speak to that. Um, I, I mean, I would imagine that if they're proposing to put a site in there, they've got some, you know, tentative agreements about that, but I, I'm, I'm not their attorney, Just so I can't tell you that. But I would say that, um, you know, there's been a number of hearings and processes both before the Board of Health, this board, and um, otherwise vetting the site. So this is not the first night this is just sort of coming up. Exactly right. So, so please uh, feel free I'll, to follow up with my I'll office. I'll send you an email we'll, or yeah, give you a call. Absolutely. That'd be perfect. Thank perfect. you very much. Thank you. <laughs> So, next item, 10, Proposition 2.5 Override, Debt Exclusion, Mr. Dunn. Uh, so, we had a Budget and Revenue Task Force meeting today at 6 o'clock where, we actually, where a lot of this came up. So, for a number of people, this is probably a, a rehash, but it's, this board is the board that actually puts Proposition 2.5 uh, questions on the ballot. So, uh, it's very appropriate that we put it on the agenda, which is why it's there. Uh, and just if, if there's any confusion, I didn't expect that we would take a vote tonight. This was very much us. Uh, there's a conversation to be had, and it, there's no time to start it like the present in this uh, particular case. So um, things that we need to think about in terms of the override are that the school enrollment task force is meeting, and it is considering uh, to, it is considering both problems with enrollment capacity both in the middle school and the elementary school arena. And it is evaluating whether or not it should renovate the Gibbs or ex extend the Audison. And either one of them comes with a price tag that's on the order of 20 to 30 million or something in that neighborhood. Uh, whether or not it should extend the Thompson and which would be perhaps something like 3 million, which is something that this has received some consideration already, and whether or not there should be something done to extend the Hardy, which has received much less consideration and is much pr more preliminary. So those are the, the middle school and elementary school considerations of if we were going to pay for them, how much would we pay and, and, uh, and, and when would that happen. Did I capture the task force correctly, Adam? Okay. Uh, other consideration is the Arlington High School, where the high school, it's, uh, we're are hoping to be accepted fully into the Mass School Building Authority in May, and at which point in May we're going to have 270 days to come up with the money to pay for a feasibility study, and that would be on the order of a million and a half or two million, something like that. And then, of course, provided that all that proceeds <laughs> appropriately, we would then be in, um, seeking to find funding for the full school itself, which is a number that you know we can only speculate on, but it would be, you know. Whether it's whether it's 150 million or whether it's 200 million, it's you know it is it's a big it's a big item. Uh, and last but not least, there's the question about Minuteman, and uh, we have in correspondence received today we've got a, the official notice from Minuteman School Committee saying that they've approved 
the building project for $144 million. And so that means that each town has 60 days to vote yay or nay. And we will be considering it at our special uh, town meeting on April 27th. And should the town would choose to pay for it and should it get approved or even should in some scenarios should it be disapproved but or excuse me should we disapprove of it but it still gets approved we may be forced to pay for it under certain circumstances um, so we have to think about how to pay for all those things so should we do an override in June and if we did an override in June would it include would it include money for Thompson such that the Thompson extension could presumably ready, be ready for September of 2018? Um, if we do money for a middle school, uh, it might be ready for September of 2018, but it's not clear that we'd be able to hit that target. Um, I already explained the unknowns around Minuteman. Uh, we could definitely do that. We could d definitely narrow down the feasibility, the cost of the Arlington High School feasibility study. So that would be a scenario, like pay for some of these things, do it in one uh, vote in June. Another scenario is to move, let those things wait until the fall, see the enrollment numbers, learn more about what we, the cost of what we want to do, may or may not want to do about Hardy, learn more about the cost of what the high school and the high school feasibility study is, but then none of the stuff would be ready if we, is, if we then hold that override vote in uh, the fall, September, October, November, something like that. There's already two elections going to be scheduled for the fall, one for the, the, the primary for state elections and one for uh, the presidential. Uh, and then, of course, um, Long Range Plan says that we will have, uh, we can, that our current funding for operating budget says that our operating budget is currently good through fiscal 2020, but it has a large deficit for fiscal 21, and it has a gigantic deficit for fiscal 22. So we were going to need an operating override somewhere in the time frame between now and uh, 2021 uh, without, uh, unless we want to start kicking off some serious cuts. So all those things are out there, and we have to put together a timeline that makes sense uh, in terms of getting to the voters and choosing what we think is important, getting it to the voters and seeking their approval. Did I miss anything? No, that was that was sad. <laughs> <laughs> that is. Yes, yes, Joe. But well done, Dan. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah, no, very well done. Um, we've obviously we've discussed this extensively at long range planning as well. Um, just to give a, a sense of the magnitude, we talked about this in, right now in Budget and Revenue Task Force, the near-term Arlington school needs, Thompson, if we go with an addition there, three to five million dollars. Middle school, we were given kind of a, an upper estimate of around 30 million dollars, could be less, but, but um, <clears throat> and uh, the high school feasibility study somewhere between 1.5 and 2 million, which that has a time clock on it. 270 days after after May, so that's that's about 37 million there that we have to find for our local school needs. We presume sometime over the next year. One of the things I, I just want to put it out here now for us to think about um, that we've discussed at Long Range Planning is debt exclusion is almost certainly going to have to be the primary vehicle for for financing this. But the subject has come up at Long Range Plan about us taking another look at the MWRA debt shift that we've done over the years. That was obviously, that was instituted what, 25 years ago or so to avoid rate shocks at the time that the Boston Harbor cleanup came in. We were quite a ways past that and uh, our board as we're thinking about this, we're thinking about impacts on taxpayers, might wanna think about how much we subsidize that debt and whether we wanna redirect some of that tax revenue towards some of the other capital needs that we have um, in the town. I mean, I think the philosophy on water and sewer rates here, especially in the way that we've structured the rates, has been to try to put more control in the hands of, of the, um, the rate payers and incentives to, to try to uh, minimize their, their water use. And I think that would be consistent with that if we thought about it. So I just did some back of the, the envelope um, Calculations, and there are just two things I think that we should think about as we're looking out over the long-range long plan. The first thing I looked at was um, 
when we look at our exempt debt service, which almost, almost exclusively went towards the previous school rebuilds, almost a little bit for Sims, but almost exclusively towards the current school rebuilds, as you look out towards FY uh, 2022, you start seeing that rolling off to the point where from now, from FY 2016 to FY 2022, we're gonna be almost $2 million per year less that's, that's going out to exempt debt because we'll have paid it off. We'd still have to go back to the voters to raise that, but cumulatively, I and mean, we're talking about 6.2 million, which, which would actually be really a wash if we go to the voters. It's a, it's a matter of, of timing. So if we keep that in mind, I also did a back of the- Wait, Joe, two million over six years, isn't that 12? <clears throat> so currently, our annual exempt debt service in FY 2016 is 2.6 million. But when we go out to 2022, it's only 696,000. Okay. We will, we will have, it will have dropped. So the payments are dropping as we're paying off, okay. paying off the debt. If you take all of those, the drops each year and you, and you, you compound the effect over the term yep. of the plan, you're looking at about 6.2 million, which we would then have to go to the voters and make up, but it, it's essentially a, a, a break, even, break even. If you look at the MWRA debt shift, which right now, it's 5.593112, I think it's been that for a, a, a long time. If we considered, and obviously we're not gonna consider this tonight, but we should think about it as we come up. If we considered gradually rolling that off over the course of five years, let's say, um, the compound effect over, over that, that period of time would be $16.7 million, um, which is roughly, equivalent to maybe maybe half of the middle school needs, possibly more. It's just something to think about as we're coming up on this, and we're gonna have a lot of questions about timing, and I felt like the tide started to shift in our discussions tonight towards a, a fall date to, to, to really be able to button all of this up together in a facilities uh, plan and give us the time, but I think that this board probably, we probably wanna consider what our policy will be going forward on that as far as debt shift as well as going to the voters on, on tax increase to, to help to, to, to help uh, buffer the, the potential tax increase. But uh, on the debt shift, wouldn't yep. we still have to go to the voters to do what you're talking about? No, no, no. We, we can do that. that. <coughs> we can do that. Okay. Yep. Go ahead. <clears throat> Sorry, just very briefly, um, I'm definitely in support of something in the fall. Um, I met with, I think we've all had a shot at pretty much a co-chairing an override or debt exclusion. Yeah. I met with one of my counterparts um, last week. And one of the things that I feel very strongly about is, number one, you need at least eight weeks to do the campaign, to do the education. Number two, you need to go in with firm numbers. There can't be any fluidity. I mean, in terms of whether you're talking 20, 25, 30. You know, if something becomes 20.5, that's different. Um, and I think for the reasons that uh, my colleague, Mr. Dunn, cited, um, in terms of what the school enrollment task force is doing. We have a consultant that Mr. Chapelain has spoken about who's given us sort of, a, going to give us sort of a halfway through the project. We seem to have more of a handle on an estimate of um, the Gibbs, but f for myself personally, I'm sort of at the beginning of hearing what Audison edition might look like and a cost might be. And I know um, going to the voters when we're very prepared, as well as we've done everything similar to what Mr. Kiro has said in terms of trying to scratch the pennies, nickels, and dimes. Um, the voters have been very, very generous, but I think a lot of that um, has been in terms of the leaders of whether it's an override or an exclusion to be able to articulately say exactly what the package is, what it's going to cost. Um, and I think maybe one of the if we wanted to take a kudo, um, I think we've demonstrated to the voters when we, um, for the last override, said this is going to be a five-year override, and we're up to a year or nine. We said three. Three? So oh, three. Three. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Oh, maybe mine was five. Nine. Mine five was five, and, and it went to five, like nine. Five, five, five made six. six, and the okay. three is now on right. six. Yeah. So, and I, and but that's one of the pieces I'd like to do that. So, for all those reasons, I won't, you know beat a dead horse on that. I think June is just too ambitious, and it really could set us up for quite an uphill battle um, in terms of success. Just on that, if I may, Steve, 
uh, and correct me, you two who are there, but uh, the issue with waiting till the fall uh, to Dr. Bodie is the ability to either have the addition to the artisan or the, or the rehabbing of the Gibbs by September of 2018. Um, and I believe she felt that if we waited till the fall, we would not be able to get students in by September of 18. So, but I, yeah. I'm with you. You and I know how long these things take to convince voters. And if I can just speak, and I'm sure Mr. Chapelain has said this, I get a sense, and correct me if I'm wrong, from the School Enrollment Task Force Committee that, you know, given that um, statement by Dr. Bodie, um, I would say most of the majority is still of the opinion they really want to see the enrollment numbers um, in the fall to do the further projections out, as well as the fact that um, we have uh, gotten, hopefully we'll get approval finally, um, but have put in place in the, in the task forces in favor of modular classrooms, although um, I think the town manager or somebody else cited that's really not a viable fiscal long-term <coughs> solution, but could get us through that. So um, I think just from the school enrollment task force committee, we, you know, we want to see some more numbers too. <coughs> I'm sorry, I have salad with um, onions. Thank you very much. And, um, I, I th Thank you for Dan for putting this on the agenda because I think it's um, important that we don't lose sight of this. I, uh, I know that we obviously talk about it a fair amount, but I think it's important that it's um, done in, uh, you know, at official meetings. Um, I, I do uh, agree with um, Diane and the other colleagues that I think the summer is probably a bit too ambitious. Um, I, um, I, I think, it, like as Diane said, it's important that we have everything very firm. And when, it, when I went to the, or when we, I think Joe and I and everyone was at the presentation for the school consultant for the enrollment numbers, it, it sounded like it was very important that we, you know, got the numbers, the follow-up numbers as well to make sure that the study was, you know, um, going on the right track and that it was still valid. Um, so I think it, it's very important that we get those numbers prior to, you know, taking a, a pretty overwhelming vote. Um, I think this is, uh, you know, it's not something that can be done lightly or without, you know, without having all of the facts in front of us. So I, I do think that pushing it off till the fall is probably the right, the right choice here. So, you know, if we look at the next 10 years, we're talking about um, debt exclusions uh, related to the Thompson, the Hardy, the Middle, <coughs> the high school, the Minutemen. And then we're tied, Eventually, yeah. what I miss? Which one? Did I miss one? No, nope. operating. I was gonna do that next. Sorry. By 2022, a $15 million deficit in the budget, right? Am I right, was it 15? 15. So, and this board has the fun job of putting all of those questions before the voters, but that is structurally the only way that money can be raised in this community as we turn it over to the voters. So, what would we all think about, you know, we have the, uh, oh, did you want to comment yet, Adam, first? No, no, okay. no, no, no. So we have the, uh, the uh, School Enrollment Task Force working on this. We have Finance Committee, Capital, uh, plan, uh, capital Planning, we have uh, uh, certainly uh, the School Committee, we certainly have uh, Adam, we have the Budget and Revenue Task Force. We have all of these groups working together on this. And, and what would we think about putting together something like uh, Mr. Dunn, Mr. Curo, Superintendent Bodie, Chairman Schlichtman, Adam Chapterling, Charlie Foskett, uh, which represents all of those groups in terms of the uh, coming back at some point to that budget and revenue task force, or directly here, if you think that's appropriate, with kind of what are the kind of alternatives, uh, options that, that we would have, because we need a 10-year plan, not a by the fall. I mean, I, I agree with you two. We have to uh, probably wait until the fall to do this, and I understand that's a challenge for the schools to deal with. But to get these passed, one right after the other, or I mean, one of the, one of the um, one of the options thrown in tonight was let's throw in uh, the uh, $30 million for the proposed, for the possible Minuteman uh, 
rebuild the cost to Arlington into the into a first debt exclusion. But if we could have, you know, plan A, plan B, and plan C, um, is that the right group to do it? Are you willing to do it? I was gonna do I don't know. I have a feeling we might thing, be, we might right? be saying the same. My my feeling is that uh, what you've just described is is more or less a subset of the um, long range planning committee, yeah. and that that long range planning committee should probably take it on as a charge to um, try to lay out those. And that is kind of what we what we try to do. We vet vet these plans. So I, I think that's actually the, the proper place to do it. It's it's. Just about everybody that you've mentioned. It's all those stakeholders yeah, yeah, no. um, that, that, that you've mentioned. And um, I think that's probably the, the most appropriate way to do it rather than agree and totally. We were going to say the same agree. thing. Okay. So I withdraw my idea. It was scrap, but. You know. No, the idea was good. We just started good. doing well, it. But you know, I, mean, we just, I know we have so many committees, so many people working on this, but it's, it, we, we have a huge challenge in front of us. We often have. We'll meet it. We'll figure it out. But as we all know, things have to happen at town meeting yet. And, and yeah, Dan. I think that you you stated this already, but I'm gonna repeat it because I think it really is really important. The the cost of not doing it this spring is that it delays um, the improvements of certainly the middle school until 2019, and perhaps Thompson until 2019. Though it may be possible that Thompson still gets done in 2018. So it, uh, while I'm I I. I definitely understand the merits of the fall. I just want to be clear about what the cost that we're incurring by delaying till the fall. Yes, um, I think yeah, just as, as, as a counter to that, and I, I do I do see um, why that's the case. But I, I also think that if we were to do it in June, and please correct me if I'm wrong, then we would probably we don't we wouldn't have every all of the other projects firmed up by then. So we'd potentially have to do two. Correct. It, um, there might be enough knowledge that we can do, uh, so we could in June put together, have reasonable numbers for Thompson Middle School and our, the high school feasibility. Like those numbers would, could be, would be knowable. Mm -hmm. Minuteman would not be in a state that it's knowable. Hardy would not be in a state that it's knowable. Okay. And if, if the, those moving factors yeah, just have me thinking that maybe, and you know, maybe by the time June rolls around, we'll, we'll, we will have a better idea. But um, I, I wouldn't be tonight be comfortable doing that for Definitely. sure, or not. Yeah. Mm. And you said we're not even really sure about enrollment figures yet, right? What What does it look like in six, eight, ten years, right? Exactly. Yeah. That's what. Mr. Kerr. Well, one thing that. that um, should mention that was that brought up right at the end of Budget and Revenue Task Force tonight by Mr. Cole, who's the chair of our Permanent Town Building Committee, is that if there is a way to pull together um, the funds just for a preliminary design around a middle school um, uh, approach, and he estimated about $750,000, which is not small change, if there were a way to do that, it could still be possible to push to a fall referendum and still maintain the, the date so there may be a way forward although admittedly that's that's a big big chunk of change and I think we walked away agreeing that the, the manager was going to talk to some of the others at the table about what is potentially feasible there um, I wanted to say on timing I mean just one other thing just to throw into the mix I mean I've I've been of the mind over the last month or so that June was the right time just because there's been so momentum so much momentum so much organization by parents and so much attention on this. However, um, Minuteman is, to use the, our favorite term now, the fly in the ointment here, and there's sounds like there's a very real possibility that Minuteman is going to impose a ballot on member communities probably on June 18th, and I'm worried about voter confusion then if we were trying to go for a debt exclusion within a week or two of a Minuteman vote. Um, I'm just worried that it, it could turn into a big train wreck in that case. So. And, and I said over the next 10 years, it's really over the next six, all of these issues are coming yeah. up, you know. So, Adam, uh, what's the solution? Just just explain it to me if you <laughs> um, So then, should we have a motion that this board ask the Long Range Planning Committee to develop scenarios so to, moved. To present back here. Mm -hmm. 
So moved. Second. Second. Yep, Ms. Mahoney. And, and just one question, um, and I apologize for missing the budget run movement task force meeting, or if this is already, I haven't seen it come across. But just to that end, um, Mr. Cole provided at the last school enrollment task force committee meeting, he spent a lot of time on a matrix. Have you all received that? And if not, I was wondering if, um, if I could ask the town manager if you can get a copy of that electronically. I mean, it, what he did in there is for every issue, school related, <coughs> that Mr. Grayley cited, all five or six of them, he came up with a matrix, and for every school building projects, he had a June, he had a <clears throat> September, he had a November, and he also took the steps out to, if you did it in June, you could open this time in 18, and here's your backup plan. You know, you can open in September or you can open January 1st. So um, I was thinking maybe that might be something, not to recreate the wheel, um, but just something just so you all can look at a matrix also um, and it just extrapolate from that whatever you think is appropriate so you're not just double doing what he's already done. And I think it would be interesting, and I probably should have just grabbed this from the uh, last meeting that Joe and I were at because um, he put a, John I have, I have it electronic. okay so if you can I mean when I first got it I looked at it and I went oh no definitely need the glasses and here it goes some more columns are gonna drive me nuts but it definitely every column was worth looking at and he there were you know three steps out for every single thing so I think that might be beneficial so thank you in support of the motion which I think was already okay so moving this burn second by Ms. Mahan uh, no yeah that's fine no, yes Okay, so um, uh, final words, anything, Adam? Uh, only that the, the Long Range Planning Committee will, will set a meeting up very soon and I think it's, it's, it's well suited and, and ready to, to go through these issues and make a recommendation. Okay. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed. Next is rehearing of Warren Article 24, Bylaw Amendment Camping on Public Property. Mr. Hine. So as the board will recall, we did have a hearing on <coughs> Article 24 where some of the issues reg regarding the proposed bylaw amendment to uh, prohibit camping on public property without a permit were vetted. Uh, at that hearing, there was discussion of how this would impact uh, Arlington's homeless population. But I think there's universal agreement among town departments that following some inquiries and concerns expressed by residents, including Mr. Revelek, who is here at that uh, hearing, the Arlington Human Rights Commission, a number of community stakeholders, including faith-based organizations, that some uh, additional discussion of this was merited and that uh, at the very minimum, we should be putting the brakes on the proposal that was before the selectmen and the police department the health department, the town manager's office, the planning department, are all in basic agreement that rather than uh, move forward with a lack of consensus on not only what we should be doing, but whether or not we have the information that we need to uh, proceed under the bylaw as proposed, uh, we should be uh, taking no action on this and uh, setting up a task force to examine this issue more closely so that we can best sort of understand from multiple perspectives the complex and varied issues, uh, particularly with respect, or specifically with respect to how something like this would impact Arlington's homeless population. So the recommendation specifically from the town departments is that we uh, would like the Board of Selectmen to establish a task force of the selectmen that would constitute uh, nine members that would uh, be representative of different uh, folks who have some important voice in this. Representatives of the police department, the health department, the planning department, the rec department, the Arlington Human Rights Commission, and then uh, perhaps most importantly, four representatives, two to be appointed by the town manager and two to be appointed by the town moderator uh, who would represent residents at large. Um, with the additional caveat that it would probably be wise to reserve two of those, one each for town moderator and town manager uh, positions on this task force for folks who are residents of the precinct that are most directly affected by the camps in the Thorndike Field area. Uh, to try to balance the fact that there are 
uh, concerns that uh, police department and others have expressed that are pressing, but there have been a sort of wave of very concerns expressing um, concerns about whether or not, again, we understand the homeless population specifically in that area well enough to take the types of actions that we've been contemplating with this bylaw. So I'm, I'm happy to ans answer any questions, but essentially the, the recommendation of the uh, town departments that are all uh, most influenced by this is that we should be rehearing this, taking, putting the brakes on it, and making sure that we study the issue, but hopefully in time to make a recommendation about whether or not we should be pursuing any uh, bylaw changes on this in time for next year's town warrant. So um, what you're asking us to do is no action on this and then establish the task force. That's correct. Okay, motion of no so action. Moved. So move, second. Second. Discussion? Yes. Okay Got it? You yeah, have to. The millions watching at home. Hi, my name is Eric Siegel. Uh, I live on Milton Street in East Arlington. I've lived there for 30 years. So right near kind of the area that there's a lot of concern about. Um, I've seen over the last couple of years, obviously, there's more and more homeless people who are living right near the underpass of Route 2 on the Arlington side and on the Cambridge side. And my daughters walk through there all the time. I'm very concerned about it. But I, also, I still feel like the direction that the or proposed ordinance was going was not a good idea, and I'm really happy to hear that you're thinking of putting the brakes on that. I think that we don't, it's not right to punish somebody for who they are. You know, if a barber committed a crime, we wouldn't say, okay, we're gonna round up the barbers. And in this case, a homeless person committed a crime last summer, but in the, with the bigger picture, homeless people are much more likely to be the victims of crime, to be the vic victims of theft or physical violence than almost anybody else in the community. And to say that we could have an ordinance, I mean, in New England, to say that we could have an ordinance where we're gonna take somebody's blankets away in the winter, I, feels really kind of profoundly unkind to me. And so I'm very happy to hear that you may reconsider it and um, uh, Thank you. I guess that's it. Thanks very much. And you are, you're volunteering for the task force? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Uh, if you'd like me to, I'd be happy to talk. Make sure Marie gets your name, if you will. <laughs> Eric Siegel, no, no, Milton that, Street. That's awesome. Yeah. Thank you for that input. Said. And we agree with you. That's why we are putting the brakes on it. Nobody, we, we do not want to criminalize homelessness. Thank you so much. Thank you. So, uh, uh, so on the motion to table, all those in favor, please. Uh, anybody no else? I, yeah, the creation sorry, no. of the committee. <laughs> sorry, because we're not no going to talk action. it again. Right, right, right. On motion to recommend um, nope. no action uh, on on this article. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed. And then a motion to establish the task force. Doug, next. Is that right? Who's got one? So okay. moved. So moved. Second. Well, second. Whatever question. Yeah, go. Uh, who in the task force? Do you, is there a vision of who the chairman would be and or who's driving the process is it the like how do we know we're gonna like typically the in, in, my, in my experience groups like this reach their conclusions if they have a uh, a leader who is you know driven towards that conclusion you know getting it done um i didn't hear in that list of nine who the most likely candidate would be i, I would if i may i, I would Without running this by uh, the staff, I would probably suggest the planning department as they have the direct tie to the uh, Somerville's Coalition for the Homeless. Uh, that can provide us a lot of access to resources. Uh, and I think they might be able to not necessarily be the boots on the ground that Health and Human Services and police are in response and be play more of a facilitatory role. All right. So, um, Joe, let me, if I would be permitted a modification of your motion. Uh, chair to be named by the town manager. It's fine. And... Uh, which, with the understanding that it, it kind of, well, we're putting the town manager's office on the hook to get it through for next year. That's fine. And, and members of the board, if I may, I, I can develop uh, this proposal and codify it into the board's comments so that it's very clear uh, that the board is not uh, 
just dismissing this issue, but the board is, is, is dedicated to establishing a body to study and report on it so that future action as appropriate will be taken, but that at this point in time we need more information and we want to make sure that all the stakeholders uh, who are most important are represented in that. Mr. Mm -hmm. Byrne. Um, thank you very much, and, uh, and I'm happy to support this, and um, I, I do think this is the right way to go. I, I do want, just want to put out there that I, I think that when this was first proposed, um, it, I think it was going to be done in a much more compassionate manner than um, how it's being re relayed here. Um, so I, I don't want to, I don't want to give the impression that we were going to go and round up all the homeless people down in the encampments and, you know, toss them out. Um, it was going to be a much more compassionate plan, and I, and I do trust that the town staff is, you know, always acts in, in that compassionate manner. So I'm happy um, to relook at this, but I just wanted to dispel that myth. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Okay. Um, so all of those in favor, uh, please signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed. That was Mr. Dunn's motion, correct? No. I seconded. I think it was Mr. Oh, Mr. Carroll. Carroll. Excuse me, Mr. Carroll. Okay. Uh, Warren article hearings. What? Excuse First me. one up is Article 22, Bylaw Amendment, Tree, tree Preservation Bylaw. To see if the town will vote to amend the town bylaws to establish a tree preservation bylaw to preserve or replace trees over a specific size within the setback of private property in cases of significant demolition and or major construction, including providing enforcement measures and or fines for non-compliance or take any action related thereto inserted at the request of the tree committee. Go. Um, good evening, select people. Um, I didn't know if, if um, town council was gonna give a, a summary of his remarks concerning the bylaw first. No. That's Not normal. Yeah. No. No, we'll okay. hear from you first, yeah. Whatever the chairman says, I'd listen. So, um, <laughs> my name is Susan Stamps. I'm on the tree committee, and with me I have co-chair Mary Ellen Arano and Sally Nash, also on the tree committee. And um, a, the tree preservation bylaw is Article 22 before town meeting. It would look to uh, preserve trees as much as possible within the setback of private property during development. This is not about um, you, Mr. Chair, wanting to take down a tree in your backyard. This is only during major development, um, defined as new construction, demolition, or increase in the footprint of a residence, or actually, it, this applies to either commercial or residential real estate, 50% um, increase in the footprint. I'd just like to back up and give a little bit of history why we're here today. Um, this was not on our radar screen until January of 2015 when a resident of Olden Road, Larry Englisher, who's here today in the audience, uh, came to our tree committee meeting and, and said, all, all these trees have come down in our neighborhood. Somebody's doing a development. It, it's, it's, the treescape is completely gone. I like to go out and walk and it's just not fun anymore. What can be done about it? And we kind of looked at each other and said, well, we have no idea. Um, and we started to hear from other people and we did a little research and we found that Arlington had no regulations at all concerning uh, development. We have lots of regulations concerning development on private property, but we had no regulations regarding um, protecting trees. Uh, trees just weren't in the ra on the radar screen of any of the development bylaws. So we looked around and we saw that actually a lot of cities and towns do have some regulatory role to play in the development um, of private property when it's uh, concerning trees, including Lexington, Wellesley, Newton, um, and some other, Cambridge, and some other towns. So given that um, I think everyone would agree that the town of Arlington has been under increasing development pressure, um, the town's pretty built out, but everybody um, most people in town have seen teardowns with um, bigger houses put on I, and um, that sort of development. Um, occasionally you'll have an empty lot next to a developed lot and the empty lot gets developed too. And all that's fine. We're not an anti-development committee. We're a tree committee. And 
Um, unfortunately, what's happening is that um, more often than not, the lots are getting clear cut. The trees are completely gone. We have pictures from um, Oldham Road. This happened just last week where a resident notified us um, this little uh, ranch house used to have all these nice trees on it. I'm sure it was very nice for the people in the neighborhood to walk by. And then um, this is the after picture where they took down every single tree on the property. Um, mature trees, 16, eight, 16 or 18 trees, every single one of them. Now, I under, we understand that it is easier to develop, their, and they're probably going to be demolishing this house too. That This is what our assumption is. And um, we understand that it's often easier for developers to take down all the trees. It makes development easier, but it's by no means necessary. And we have talked to developers in other towns who have learned how to develop property without taking all the trees down. So um, anyway, we did our... Can we look at those? Yeah. Oh, certainly. Um, they are in your packet. Um, oh, they're they called the Oldham market. Road. Okay, sorry. Um, with, there's a lot of attachments there. There are a lot of attachments, yeah. but it's oh, called, it what is, is it? I got it, I got it, okay. I think it's, yeah, do you see it? There's only yeah. two there. We also have another attachment with lots of pictures of before and after around town. So as we started to talk to people about this, we went to the redevelopment board in June. We had a discussion with them. It was clear to us at that point that the town should do something. Um, we researched building permits and demolition permits. And what's happened is that the demolition permits have doubled in the last six years. I think right there that tells you something. Um, we, the redevelopment board was interested in what we were doing. We did more research. Beca we, became, we came before the selectmen, you folks, last August. And we said, we think that the town needs a bylaw. Uh, we don't really know what else to say, but this is just going to continue, and there's going to be more and more trees lost if we don't do something that is not going to impede development. And in the meantime, in at last year's town meeting, you may remember that the town meeting adopted the town's master plan, which talks a lot about trees mm -hmm. and the importance of trees to Arlington's aesthetics, character, and why people love to live here. Um, in, in addition, the open space plan was also approved by the, probably by the open space committee, perhaps by town meeting. They also talk about the importance of trees, not on private property, but just in general, people love living in Arlington partly because it's a leafy town. So um, we felt that it, it's time had come, it was time to do something, and, we, and so the board, you agreed that this might be the case and directed us to, directed town council to work with us to draft a bylaw which um, town council has done. We've worked very hard together, and, that, and the result is Article 22 on the town meeting warrant, and we're here today to ask for your support for Article 22. Mr. Martin. Thank you very much, Ms. Greeley. Um, thank you for all your work on this. Um, you know, last August when you were here, I, I believe it was me who asked you to go work with contractors and other people in town who this might affect. Um, rather than just individuals on the tree committee. Now, can you tell me a little bit about that process? Well, we have reached out to a lot of people in town um, at our tree committee booth at EcoFest, uh, excuse me, a tree committee booth at Town Day and also just last weekend at, at EcoFest. We had a lot of residents um, of all different professions living in town and to a person, they were excited about the tree preservation bylaw because everybody had seen clear cutting throughout town. We have, when I was here last time, I talked about beginning discussions with a particular person in town who is, um, does a lot of landscaping, a landscape contractor who has ties into that community. Um, he's worked with it in other towns. The, we have, um, we have a person who is trying to arrange a meeting for us. We've been trying for the last three weeks to set up a meeting with the developers. It's very important um, for us to talk to them. We want to, they may not love it, um, but I don't think it'll be as bad as they think uh, because it only applies to the trees in the setback, which they can't build in the setback anyway. 
but but so, so did in the actual drafting of this article you didn't have any like that you didn't sit down with them and say you know why don't we try to work out something that we can both agree with um, what we used for the drafting of the article was mostly tree bylaws from other towns okay. so so no is the answer and wrong. I have talked to a developer um, who built a house in Arlington several months ago. He is from Lexington. <coughs> he does some work in Ar um, Arlington. This particular place on Kiplinger Road is the only property I know about. His name is Mark Barons. Um, he's very bullish on the Lexington tree bylaw, which is much more complicated than ours, by the way. We tried to really simplify it. Uh, and he doesn't see, and he is, he's very pro let's develop in harmony with the environment the way the master plan wants us to and he thinks it's totally totally doable and um so as i said we do we have heard through the grapevine through our contacts in the builders community that the builders are are they're worrying about all the zoning bylaws and i hope that we don't get sort of thrown into the mix because what we're proposing is something that's very bland, to use the word that somebody on the FinCom used when I talked about it with him. The, um, the, under the, just to briefly explain the provisions, especially for those at home who, who wouldn't know or remember, it simply says that any trees in the, the setback of the property, which is the area that you can't build on, and typically it's uh, 20 feet from the back, 10, 10 feet from both sides and 20, 25 feet from the front of the property. That's the only area that we're talking about. Again, you can't build there anyway. So you've got those trees there. Now, if you're the builder, you can take those trees down, but you have to mitigate. In other words, the town doesn't want to lose its tree canopy um, because they're in the way of somebody trying to build a house. The, the bylaw provides that, that the developer or the owner has to either replace those trees elsewhere on the property or they have to pay into the Trees Please Fund so that the town can replant trees that equal the size of the trees that were um, lost. And so that way there's no net loss of the tree canopy, but we can still have the development we want in Arlington. It's kind of a win-win. Now, how, uh, how much will this add on to, um, you know, the cost for people building homes or renovating their homes? All right, so that's a good question. Mm -hmm. um, there'll probably be some sort of modest filing fee. They'll be required to take the, um, anybody looking to develop property will have to get a tree, a tree permit before they can take anything down. If it's going to be a new home, or an addition that's going to increase the footprint more than 50% or is it going to be a demolition? So this is not somebody wanting to put like a porch on their house or something like that. They would have to file a um, the same site plan they're going to file for their building permit or their demolition permit and they're going to they're going to pay the surveyor an incremental amount to locate the trees on the site plan, which a surveyor told us that it, they'd probably charge $10, $15 a tree. I mean, there aren't that many trees in, in the setbacks in Arlington. So maybe there are 10 trees, so that's $150, $100, dollars for the surveyor. Then they have to pay a certified arborist to submit a tree plan, which will go with that site plan. Um, explaining what's going to be done with the trees. This one's going to be removed. This one's going to be um, saved. And uh, this one that's going to be removed, we're either going to pay into the fund or we're going to replace it somewhere. So um, as far as the cost of the certified arborist to do that, typically we checked with a couple of people in Lexington. Typically they charge about $150 an hour. Estimate three, four hours something like that, to go out to the site, take a look. Our properties are not that big. Uh, and then go back and decide what they're going to do. So uh, so overall it would be like, say, uh, around a, a thousand, maybe a, a little more for something all like this that. work? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And um, 
I guess the only, the only other thing that really stu stuck out to me is the role of the tree warden. It's greatly expanded uh, under this. Um, potentially, you know, to the point where we kind of have to create, you know, a, a new position and fund it individually. Um, I, I'm going, I've been going back and forth on that since, since I've been reading it to see whether or not, um, you know, it, it's even viable at this time. We just had a discussion about, you know, what, what we have to, what we're looking at over the next few years. And um, it, it does, you know, give me some, you know, I, I do worry about that. And uh, the only other point that I, I saw in there that, that really stuck out to me was giving the tree warden access to the property at any time during construction. I, I just, I, I think that might be a, a little too much. Um, you know, I, I don't think that uh, town employees should be walking around a construction site at any point that they, you know, deem necessary. Um, you know, I think that it has to be a little more straightforward if this is to go through mm -hmm. the um, as I understood this is the first time that I've come before you uh, before the board asking for support for an, a warrant article um, or to make it their own I think and uh, the way the process was explained to me was that perhaps you would vote to support it with some amendments mm -hmm. with some conditions if it's rewritten that way it becomes your bylaw, your 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 warrant article, and it's written, perhaps with the restrictions on when, yeah, and we would be correct. fine with that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'm good. Thank you, Ms. Mahan. Um, <clears throat> try not to say something that's a pun. I see the beginnings of um, a good idea here. Um, however. I, I have an awful lot of concerns in terms of this is something that we really need to fine tune, get a handle on. Um, my, my first question would be, um, having worked in development with unions, also on the legal side, what I would want to ask you, and if you can just, you know, I don't. I want to hear what it is you all have an answer to the question, and if you don't, that's fine too. But when you go through a construction project and you look at the different facets of it, and I'm just going to just throw any number in there. But what you do is you look at, okay, here's cost of uh, doing business. Permits this much. This is how much time that's going to cost in the project. HVAC. This is how much I need. This is what the work encompasses in terms of time and money. That's what that's going to be. When I look at this proposed um, bylaw, um, if this were to take in effect in its entirety, and I know Mr. Byrne just touched briefly on an estimate in terms of monetarily what it would cost, what is the time factor associated with getting this all done? And I'd like a to and from. The, the first time factor would be if everything was smooth as breezy easy and went through, it would be this much. If not, it could extend out to as far as, as, as an estimate. And I know in construction and development jobs you do that. So this would be another task. So what do you estimate the easy to outward end? Okay, well, <clears throat> excuse me. First of all, I, we're not really asking the uh, developers to do anything new because um, in order, in preparing for a development project, <clears throat> excuse me, I, uh, one of the requirements of the, the tree bylaw is to mitigate uh, damage to trees, so they should be protected, like what we did on Mass. Yeah, but, but you're proposing so, more steps. You are proposing more steps, more fines, and the, the second part that I want to speak about is the um, <coughs> extended conversation that we had for over a year, 15 months, um, led by Mr. Greeley and um, town manager and town council in terms of coming up with the Selectman's Handbook. I see at least nine different um, citations, especially in section um, five, five A, just about all of six, where you outline um, a particular course of action and then you say a fine to be determined by um, the Board of Selectmen, rules, regulations to be um, uh, established, determined, and promulgated by the Board of Selectmen. So my second question is going to be the same thing as this one. What are you talking about and how much time? So I, w I would anticipate, and you're asking, mm -hmm. just speaking for mm -hmm. myself, I'm not speaking for the entire board, but you're asking me personally to um, sort of take this over, and I'm perfectly capable with you all doing that. Um, but if I were to do that, 
and any one of us were chair next year, it's a viable question that I would anticipate that you all have sat down in terms of you're adding another punch list item or whatever you want to call it, a benchmark on a development plan, and especially if they were to encompass everything which I have read and everybody else has, but especially in section three, five, and six, taking out what you're asking the selectmen to do, how, how much time is that? All right, so the, <coughs> excuse me, the, the developer has to have a surveyor draw the trees on the site plan and have a certified arborist prepare a tree plan. Now those are things that they can do anytime. Um, they can do that <clears throat> during the couple of weeks, two or three weeks it takes them to pull together all the information they need for the building permit um, while the house is being designed, while things are being thought about. I don't see that it adds anything in terms of a time frame. It's just something that needs to be done. Presumably, there already would be thought going into, well, what trees do I want to take out, and how do I want to protect the trees that are remaining there? So we're not really asking them to do anything new. We're asking them to put it on paper and talk to the tree warden about it. And if they're going to take out trees, that for the first time, instead of developers being able to diminish the tree canopy in town, they're going to have to um, replace the trees they take out, which I don't think is, is an unreasonable thing to do. It's not going to add any extra time. They have, I mean, once a project is finished, normally a developer would be doing the landscaping last. And so the landscaping will be replacing the, tr include replacing the trees that they took out or paint into the trees please fund. And those trees, there is a time frame in the bylaw that they have to be planted within 90 days after the occupancy permit. That's certainly something we're flexible on. But it actually is a process which I don't see that it extends the development process at all. I'm going to respectfully disagree. Okay. Because I, I <clears throat> spent a lot of time in this, besides the additional cost and hours of a certified arborist. And my thing is, for me to feel comfortable, I, I want to have the answers to this. So when mm -hmm. landscapers, private homeowners, developers come and say, well, what are you talking about, similar to an override or a debt exclusion, I can tell them that. Yep. You, I mean, you have in here alone, you know, you're, you're talking about the certified arborist has to come in, that they have to met. Uh, mark out all trees on the property 10 inches dbh greater than that they have to mark protected trees then they have to come up with a plan that for every and correct me if i'm misquoting for every inch db every dbh inch of protect protected trees that are removed they have to come up with a plan um uh, i believe it's 90 days after the issuance of uh, an, another permit that they have to get from the town. So right there, I see a 90-day additional thing. I, uh, I'll read it exactly. The certificate of occupancy, Ms. Mahan, is what we're talking about. You know what? Let me just find it because I just had my... Um, exactly. So that's another 90-day task, in my opinion, that they have to add into. Well, it's just giving them a good window to replace the trees. I mean, right, they can my, do it immediately. Okay, but, Mike, but that's what I'm saying. I feel... Respectfully, you, weren't, you aren't prepared to answer my question, which is how much additional time, if I say to a developer, not only this is what the estimated cost would be, mm -hmm. how much additional time does this add to their development? And that includes a developer on, who's working on behalf of a private homeowner. And I'm just saying my cursory glance through that, I see a 90-day in terms of you're talking about for every DBH inch removed um, this is the process that you have to go through. So um, what I would respectfully ask you all to make me comfortable, and I'm not saying you have to do that because it's, mm -hmm. you know, what the rest of the board says. And um, I would like you, similar to the exercise we, we go through with other, to me this is a, there's a really lot of steps in here, that you sit down and take the time to do that as well as um, what the tree warden's position um, will look like in terms of expanded hours, enforcement, and duties so that we can evaluate similar, I think I'm sort of piggybacking on Mr. Byrne, so that we can say, is this a cost that we can bear, as well as the correct interface between the tree warden and the tree committee um, to make sure that that's you know, a harmonious 
productive um, relationship um, because I've, I've seen history with that. And then my second thing that I'm uncomfortable with, which I'm okay with supporting this, but I want to know what I'm supporting, and I didn't, in my opinion, get an answer to that. And it can be done, and I don't want to sit down and do it because, you know, this isn't my ballywick. I'm not, you know, they would be disrespectful. This is something you all have taken on, and yeah, I'm just a court reporter, but I'm just a court reporter. But I know how to read this stuff. You're talking about adding, you know, a significant amount of days in terms of what developers have to do. I'm not saying they shouldn't do it. But then the other thing that I, I'm concerned about, and I'll try to be brief because I know I've already overstayed my welcome, is I would like to see, I would like to hear, and if you can't um, answer it tonight, and I apologize, I hadn't posed these questions to you before, and, and maybe I should have, but I see many, many references in sections five and six where it speaks to the Board of Selectmen. Um, there's close to a dozen that talks about, um, it lists different scenarios. It lists about eight or nine different scenarios. If this happens, if you remove a tree and you shouldn't. If this happens, you removed a tree and you didn't replace it with the proper um, DBH inches. You don't want me to stop reading it. It's, it's, it's in here. But no, you, I'm, I, and here's my concern. Do you have, let me find one, when you, let me find section five. When you say, um, it's in here where you say the selectmen shall um, come to and promulgate um, rules, regulations, and establish any fines, um, which will then go to the tree fund. And you reference that a half a dozen times in different actions in here. What are the? What is that process? Or are you asking this board of selectmen that we need to sit down and say, let's take all these six case scenarios. If this happens. Um, this is what our, because you're asking, you use the words in here. We want you to promulgate, you know, create and promulgate rules and regulations regarding this specific. It's all in section five and section six. So. Um, well, thank you for the question. <clears throat> it's a good question. We, there were some, uh, like the Lexington bylaw, if you were to look at that, you would see that they probably don't have to promulgate any rules and regulations because everything is in there in excruciating detail. I'm not going to look at Lexington. We didn't feel I'm just asking that you that was appropriate what, what you for want Arlington. Us to do? And that's what I'm saying. Um, because so that, for example, you don't run into if we put specifically, well, here's X number of dollars that you have to pay to replace a tree. We didn't do that. We said, um, here's the amount of money you have to replace a tree based on labor and materials at the time. That's something that can be determined um, similar to the, the determinations for the tree removal hearings. And why did we do that? Well, if you look at the Chapter 87, the Public Shade Tree Law, which governs public shade trees, the fine for cutting down an individual going out and cutting down a, a big, huge public shade tree without permission is $500, which is completely ridiculous. So we thought that instead of putting um, some of these time-specific <coughs> numbers in here, that it made more sense for the board, and it doesn't have to be the selectmen. If you want the tree committee to promulgate these rules and regulations, that's fine. We were simply being deferential to the selectmen. We do know you're very busy. Um, as far as the fines go, it, it, the selectmen wouldn't be asked to determine if somebody violated the bylaw, but only determine what the fines would be. Now, we are perfectly happy to sit down and make a proposal as to what the fines would be, and if you want us to put them in the bylaw, we'll put them in the bylaw. Um, the, we would have to, I think they might be in the stormwater bylaw. It's possible that they're in our, some of our wetlands bylaws, uh, we haven't, to be honest with you, we haven't had a chance to figure out, we want to do what the town does with other similar bylaws which regulate um, activity on um, private property, and that includes the stormwater bylaw and the Wetlands Protection Act. So, All right, I, I think I've monopolized the time to encapsulate it to my colleagues. Here's my concern, reading this with my professional hat on, um, there are there are additional days. Um, some could say up to 120 days, in terms of me looking at the different processes that have to um, kick in here, including the one that I cited. Not which you have to fix it. Not, you have to wait until certificate of occupancy. You have 90 days to um, do that. <clears throat> and someone can say, well, you know what, you're going to do things 90 days afterwards. But 
what I want to know is what it is we're doing and what it is we're, we're expecting because it's going to be another 90 days. You're going to put you know some of your HVAC guys off or others, and then it does cite in here nine times. I apologize, it wasn't 12. That you know if you violate this that we need to come up with the regulations. Um, and it, it does cite other ordinances in uh, Lexington, Cambridge, Newton, Wellesley. Um, but I don't have time to look at all that. I would feel much more comfortable if this was something that I was going to adopt and put forward to town meeting. Because I remember many years ago, a well-hearted citizen filed something, and everybody in town claimed all building in Arlington would stop. And this is more far encompassing than that particular article was. So I don't want to walk down there. So I'm just not comfortable supporting it because I don't know what it is. Um, may I just say one no. thing no, about I, the 90 I was just day? Trying to notice, I'm trying it, to, there's a no. misunderstanding. No, I'm okay. trying to get to three with my colleagues, and I may not. I'm you sorry, may have it. It's okay. Right. Sorry. Yep. Uh, but thank you for being here and going <clears> through this and all the work you've put into it so far. And uh, But I would just like to ask one point of clarification, if I may, Dan. Did you say something like, but the removal of a tree at five hundred dollars is ridiculous. Did you it, uh, uh, meaning it would be much more expensive than that? Or I, I'm, I'm not quite sure what your reference was. That's the fine under the public shade tree law for removing a big. If it was a big twenty-four inch <coughs> old tree, right. and um, at the very least, the town would want to replace trees to take its place. Right. You're talking about quite a few trees. If they're three, four inches wide, you're talking about six trees. That's way more than $500, labor and materials. Plus, for a fine, you want to have an incentive for people not to violate the bylaw. Okay, I just wasn't yeah. sure what $500 was ridiculous was referring to, too little or too much. But oh. Mr. Dunn's been waiting. Um, I, I think I probably have four questions. Um, so the first one, uh, I think you said something a, a couple of minutes ago that I, I don't, I, I don't think you meant. <laughs> uh, and so you said that you're not asking the developers to do anything new. I think, but I correct. I don't think that's. Well, I mean, we are. This bylaw, if passed, would be asking for additional work from developers. Yes. Yes, I'm saying it's not a different <laughs> okay. kind of thing, though. I mean, they do the okay. landscaping. Okay. They they already are doing that sort of thing. All right. I think, but I think That's when we're I talking about this type of thing, the clarity is really important. Okay. And um, and especially, and well, it may be that the argument in favor of it is that it's within the scope and it's not too bad and it's the right thing, it's the right balance. But to say no is contradictory to just, you know, what's the black and white. And so I think it's important that we, we, we stick with yeah. it. Okay. Uh, all right. I don't think it does depend. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but it doesn't depend. I meant you a new have to yeah. file the paper. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, I want to explore a couple of cases about like what the bylaw does because I, I, I am seeking clarity on a few of the things. Yeah. Um, uh, so the no construction case. I've got a tree um, on my property. I'm not planning any construction for the foreseeable future, and I want to take it down. This bylaw has no effect. No correct. Okay. Um, I am planning construction, and I have trees that are um, towards the edge of my property, this, which is specified in what's called the setback area. This bylaw applies to them, but all the trees that I would describe as the center, you know, not on the edges, this bylaw doesn't affect those trees. Correct. Now, if I plan on taking trees that are, say, in the center of my property, mm -hmm. but I'm not touching any, setback any of the setback, do I still have to file everything? You know, that's a good question because I think that you would need to talk to the tree warden just to make sure everything's okay um, because the bylaw, because of the clear cutting that's been going on yeah. gotcha. and... I'm going to stop you because yeah, I want to I'm hear sorry. the Doug, do you have the answer? So technically, probably not. The problem is what happens if there's a dispute about whether or not you need to submit a tree plan. So if I were, uh, you know, the tree warden, um, or if I were a developer, I would want to basically at least have some idea of some confirmation that I'm, I don't have protected trees on my within the scope of my plans. Okay. Um, yes, and actually, I'm I'm just looking at the bylaw again, and you're right that if you unless the trees are in the setback, there's no prohibition against removing them. Period. So they, no, they wouldn't have to go talk to the tree warden. Okay. Um, 
So one of the things that, I, that you briefly mentioned just a minute ago, but I think is really important that we, because I think it uh, helps us understand more about the bylaw. Can you talk about the public shade law and the difference between public trees and private trees and what the public tree protections are that already exist? Because I think those are really important in the context of what this bylaw. Because to me, it, yeah. one of the, to me, the, you know, please correct me if my understanding is wrong. But this bylaw would be a supplement or you know a, a, a different tool. But there is already an existing of this this public law. Yes, um, there is Chapter 87, the Public Shade Tree Law, which um, everybody knows about the street trees. They are the trees on the Let's street. Assume we don't. The so tree. Okay, this is actually so, a really good thing for us to talk about. Okay, great. Because it sets the, yeah. it sets the, so, the what is going to be talked about at town meeting. So it's a great. Let's start with the absolute basics. All right. So the the town owns the roads, as far as I know. <laughs> well, except for the most of them private roads. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, and also, as I understand it, and town council will jump in. I hope if I'm wrong, owns an easement into the private property for some. For a ways the and typically you have the road you have a strip of green then you have the sidewalk and then you have the person's property all the trees that are planted in that what we call the tree strip which is between the road and the sidewalk those are all on town property and those are considered town trees and they come under the public shade tree law that's why you see the the town going out and planting trees there and an, in, an individual cannot cut down a public shade tree without permission from the town. And the town is not going to give permission to take down a public shade tree unless there's a really, really good reason for it, like it's hanging over uh, the road and, and endangering someone or it's diseased or that sort of thing. And so, Doug, correct me if I'm wrong, or do you want to? No, go ahead. Uh, the tree, so it isn't just the strip depending upon the road and what's going on, it's inside the sidewalk as well, as in the town, the house side of the sidewalk. In an area without sidewalks, it's a number of feet from the center of the road, something like that? It's a complicated definition, but essentially it encompasses two things. One, trees that are considered to be planted in the public way. Now that can be a little complicated, not only because of what constitutes public ways versus private ways, but because of some argument about how far the public way extends into yep. sidewalks and, and cartilage and things like that. The other thing is shades that are planted pursuant to Chapter 87, Section 7, which are essentially when people agree that they're going to have a public shade tree planted on their property. It's a little hard to keep precise track of it, but it's a fairly okay. understandable set of trees. And if I could just go on for one second, there is a process by which folks can petition to have a public shade tree removed. There's actually a fairly, um, Mr. Rademacher could speak to this, there's a fairly um, uh, heavy administrative uh, filing associ fee associated with that, and then there's basically a hearing to determine whether or not the tree should come down or not. The town can take certain measures to cut down a tree, especially in an emergency situation if it uh, poses a public risk. And then that uh, determination can be appealed, um, and that's usually where the Board of Selectmen would get involved. Okay. Thank you. Um, so, have it, uh, just one, and so one missing comment about the draft, uh, Doug, yep. is that in the severability section, it talks about if this is overruled by the Massachusetts Supreme Court, I think we should probably say any court. Okay. Um, sure. So, kind of in summary, I think one of the things that, that that set of questions helps clarify to me at least is the scope of what we're talking about and like when does this kick in and when does this not kick in um, and as for the cost I think that it's worth thinking about the fact that we can make the fee for this pay for the work that Mike Rodemacher's memo describes so we can make it revenue neutral for the town if we choose um, but I do think that the, some, something you got at Steve is really important, which is that it does increase the cost of the development, and that's something uh, we have to think about. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. I, I think a lot of what I was going to ask has been addressed. I am curious about the, the, the costs and have been getting a better handle on the cost estimate. I mean, I particular, you know, I think of homeowners want to put on an addition, for example, where, where mm -hmm. trees fall into the... Um, the, the, the setback area. I do appreciate the way you frame this, though, because clearly this is not a bylaw that's intended to, to stop um, <clears throat> stop development or demolition redevelopment. Mm -hmm. um, and 
you know, from where I sit, all, also, I mean, I think some of the discussion about the public shade law, I mean, we, we understand that trees do have externalities, negative and positive. Mm -hmm. Certainly neighbors, neighbors have rights over a tree that's potentially um, <clears throat> threatening their property or, or, or their land. And likewise, they, they enjoy the benefits of, of those as well. So I, I understand the principle. Um, one question I did have here, though, I mean, as far as the tree warden, um, drilling in on that, I think Mr. Dunn raised exactly what, what I was going to um, say is that I think that we would have to have a handle on what the permit fee would potentially be that we would have to promulgate. Uh, Mr. Rademacher gave us some information that they're probably about 40, 35 to 40 <laughs> permits a year that would probably fall under the bylaw. He anticipates it would take um, a tree warden staff member, you know, a day every week or two. <coughs> so we have to understand what the cost of that labor is. I don't know if you have that, Mr. Manager, right now That's offhand. That divided by the, the estimated number of permits would give us a, a, a sense of what each project would, uh, would cost. Um, I'll let you work on that because right? I got one other question while you are looking at that. Um, the other question I, I had though, so there's, there's cost of the tree warden, there's also capacity. Um, and I noticed that in this, um, in the proposed bylaw that the tree warden is obligated to respond within uh, 10 days. Now, in some other situations, I know some zoning board of appeals situations, if you, if you apply to the zoning board of appeals for consideration, I forget what the clock is, but if, if there is um, no action taken within a certain period of time, it's deemed, the application is deemed to be approved. And I was wondering if there was any consideration of a similar mechanism in the proposed bylaw here, where if the tree warden does not have the capacity, is not able to, to, to uh, act uh, on the application within 10 days, that it's deemed to be approved. Is that question for me or for these uh, questions? Either. Yeah. Well, we don't have anything in the bylaw on that. Um, I don't know what the precedent is in town for that. You mentioned that you think there are some zoning bylaws that say that. I don't really, I don't necessarily have an objection to dealing with it in the fairest way possible, yeah. both to the developers and to the town, remembering the value of trees. Uh, I don't know if, if uh, town council has something to say about that. Sure. So, I mean, I think there would be some principles of equity involved. Um, part, just to make a general comment, part of the tension with any bylaw like this is specificity versus flexibility. And so I do want to uh, give some support to the tree committee in the sense that uh, I was tasked with working with them. And um, I think I recognize all of the concerns that the, the selectmen are raising is, is very important. Um, but it's always difficult to strike the right balance on a first draft of something like this between how specific do you want to be so that every correction to a tree bylaw, if our experience is that it's not working the way we want it to, needs to go back to town meeting to amend it right. versus some um, regulations. Although, as, as, as uh, Ms. Mahan has, has highlighted, uh, all that regulatory sort of burden has been placed on the selectmen. So I, I just, with, with that said, um, there's probably be some principles sort of of equity. If the tree warden doesn't, you know, approve a plan that's been submitted to them, um, would you have a pretty strong case to say you can't go ahead and fine me? Let's say we determined that we wanted to fine a certain amount of dollars per day of noncompliance. Um, it'd be hard to make that argument if the tree warden didn't uh, do their job. Uh, but I think that it's something that we could work into this if the selectmen were so inclined to uh, favor action. I don't think it'd be that difficult to basically insert something that reflects. I think what you're talking about is mostly actually zoning law itself rather than zone, broader zoning law rather than specific bylaws that if you don't act on it within a certain period of time, you have a legal right under 40A to a, to a permit. So I think we'd do that. Right, right. But I'm wondering if there, was, if, if there is a reasonable way to work a similar mechanism in, into this. Oh, yes. So if, the, if the tree warden was hit with five applications in the same week, it, was, it would potentially be impossible to, to, to respond within the 10 days. And I think that having a mechanism like that may go some, some way towards a, addressing some of the additional timelines that are, that are placed on, on projects. Um, I, I think that could easily be done, yes. Um, especially taking out some of the, 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 the potential uncertainty. Um, that was my, a lot of my questions were actually are, are already asked. Um, 
I, I think that, that Mr. Dunn's questions kind of got at the, at the scope. I mean, what I do like about, about this is that it, it really is not telling people that they can't take down trees, right. but it is recognizing the, the externality and the benefit. I also have to say that on principle, I do actually think that it's, it's proper to keep the, the fees and fines with the Board of Selectmen. We, we do that in, in other cases, and the, you know, costs change over time and the value of money changes over time, and I think it makes sense when we you know, come and, and revisit this, that, that that's one of the things that we revisit, so. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So I have 16 questions which I'm not going to ask. <laughs> All those in favor? Uh, so, I mean, really, a lot, of, a lot of things have come out. You've done a lot of work, and you've tried to do it, and you know, certainly showing deference to us, and I appreciate that. But I, I just, I, I would, so let's take the Oldham Road pictures you've shown us, okay? Is it possible that the tree warden would have said okay to those trees that have been removed without a tree warden's okay? Is that possible? If the developer wanted to take all those trees out, the tree warden would have said, okay. It's just that they would have had to pay into the Trees Please Fund for the town to replace the number of so-called protected trees, uh, 10 inches or bigger, that were in the setback so that the, tr the town can plant the same kind of tree, trees that are going to end up with the same tree canopy as was lost during development. But meaning the same size tree, so if it was a 30 foot tall tree, that's what has, a 30 foot tall tree has to be put in its place? Well, I've learned quite a bit about the way trees are measured in the process of this. Myself. Well, what I learned was that they measure them, as far as I know, more in terms of the width of the tree, called the diameter of breast height. I didn't okay. want to say the and that's the diameter of the tree. And so the, um, it's what other towns have done, and what we do here is we talk about um, a 10-inch tree, or a tree of any DBH being replaced by any number of trees, the total of which is equal to what was taken out, so that if you take out a 12 DBH tree, you can replace it with four smaller trees or three slightly larger trees or anything. Okay. Yeah. Do we know what's happening at this Old Ham Road property? In other words, do we know what's coming in in its place? Well, we're assuming they're going to demolish the house next. <coughs> it's owned by a... But you don't... No, you're, no. you're assuming... Well, okay. No, we, we don't, don't know. know. We don't right. know. So... Um, it, it, but it's not occupied as far as the neighbors say. It's what? It's not occupied as far as the neighbors are telling us. Right. See, right? I, I believe that whatever's going to replace this is going to be a lot better for the neighbors than what exists right now. Mm, could I be. grant you the taking down of trees if these people maybe intend to do so. Mm -hmm. But the design of what they're putting in there. So uh, my real discomfort with this is without talking to developers, without talking to those who build houses, uh, I really want to talk to them before, because th this could be an example of after we put this whole thing into effect, not, not just before. Do you, know, do you know what I mean? It's possible what was done here might have been approved in the, in the new bylaw, right? Mm -hmm. So. Well, I, I, with respect, I do believe that some of those trees in that picture are in the setback, so they would be protected. No, you know. They could still take them out, but then they'd have to pay into the fund to, for the town to plan elsewhere, or they'd have to put them elsewhere on the property. So that's what I'm Which saying. Yes, yeah, so they do that. So no, they don't do that. Is during development, no. huh? they might, but they do, they're not required to. <laughs> my, you're missing my point, Susan. Okay. I'm saying the bylaw is in effect. Yes. What I'm saying is this still could happen with the bylaw in effect. Correct. That these people remove those trees because of the design of whatever they're putting in. It's got to be better looking than what I'm looking at in this picture here. No well, offense to, yeah. uh, you're, you're telling me it's deserted, right? And they fully intend to meet that same inch capacity trees that, I'm sorry, I, I forgot. DBH, the, uh, DBH, diameter and breast height. The, yeah, I didn't want to say yeah, the yeah, full yeah, thing. Right. DBH 12 inches with four, three yeah. DBH inches. Mm -hmm. um, so what I'm saying is this still could happen. In, under the bylaw, correct? Yeah, but what we know under the bylaw will happen will, will be that those trees will be replaced. 
which can't happen now, which won't happen what do you mean now. It can't happen. We, it could Listen, happen, but only if the developer. Here, right? You told me that. You don't know what the plan is. Their plan might be to replace these trees they took down. Well, it depends on whether it's important for the town to know we want our trees replaced, or it's up to every developer. Okay. And we don't know what Sorry. trees okay. in the setback were actually removed, or if none of them, they're right, all. Right. I'm know. counting stumps, so I, I yeah. don't know. Okay, so anyhow, this is a hearing. Uh, <laughs> are there any questions we've missed, or anybody here who would wish to speak on this matter? Yes. No, I, I just like to say. No, you got to come to the microphone. Okay. Sorry. <clears throat> Millions at home listening in. Right. Okay. Half are asleep at this point. <laughs> Mom, Dad, wake up. <laughs> Sorry. Speak right into the microphone, okay? Everybody can hear? Yeah, so I, I think um, this is a really important bylaw, and a lot of time has gone into thinking th through this as carefully as possible, but of course leaving open uh, in deference to the Board of Selectmen certain decisions. We looked very carefully at other towns who seem to have gone through very similar processes, developed very um, clear and thoughtful bylaws that are designed to balance the interests of the existing residents who have, a, uh, who have a concern about their community and to enable developers to come in and build smartly, sensibly, carefully, and thoughtfully. What we have seen in our neighborhoods are developers who are coming in with no regard for the neighbors or the town, destroying all these very, we're talking very large trees. This bylaw was written for trees that are 10 inches in diameter at breast height or, or larger. We're not talking about little trees. And the height of these trees, I can't even estimate the height of the trees that, that we have lost. They're way, way over the, the heights of the houses. And, um, and so I think we've seen what's happened without a bylaw. So with this particular property, everybody can, you know, we can't say for sure what is the developer gonna do at that particular property. But we can say what's happened at other properties. And what we've seen is that people come in, clear the entire lot when they are not building in the setbacks. They do it just for their convenience. It's easy. And then people are left with virtually no trees in the neighborhood. And when they do replace a tree or two, they put a tiny little tree in the front and they sell the house for over a million dollars. I think the cost of Somebody said $1,000. I don't even know that it's that much. But if it is $1,000, it is a tiny, marginal, negligible addition to the cost of development. The developers will continue to make lots and lots of money. But the purpose of this bylaw is to just introduce, to discourage removing trees that aren't necessary, but allow the trees that are necessary to be removed, to allow the development to go into place, and then to make the contribution back to the community to improve the, uh, to restore the, um, the tree canopy. I think it's very sensible. You've raised a lot of good questions. And uh, I think that uh, the tree committee expected that there would be some, you know, little bits of fine tuning that would move forward. But it's really something that is, it's time has come. And I would just urge you to give it uh, the, be the best consideration that you can. Thank you. Okay, all right. Okay, okay. All right, thank you. Yeah. Um, so I feel like I like the police on what's being said here today. But uh, I do just want to say, you know, the, these, the people who are building homes in town, you know, I, we're, we're not talking about, you know, the massive developers that are building high rises in, you know, downtown Boston either. The, a lot of these, you know, people who are building homes in town live in Arlington. They've, uh, you know, also given quite a bit to the town. So I think that we're really kind of demonizing, you know, quite a lot of people who, who play an active role in our community as well. And I think that's important to note. Um, and I, I will go on to, um, I, I don't think I'm quite ready to vote on this yet. I know that a lot of work has gone into it. I, I think, and I, I know um, the three committee worked very diligently on this. But I, I think that we have to expand the scope of who um, comes into formulating this um, bylaw. And I think that it has to go beyond just the tree committee. And, and it, what, what worries me is that, you know, I, earlier in the evening, Ms. Stamps noted that she was going to, you know, she's in the process of setting up these meetings. 
well, you know, it, since August, we this was on the radar to hold these meetings with, you know, people who are impacted by this, and, and it just didn't happen. And now we're here voting on it, and something that is going to play a, a large, you know, will will have an impact on, on a group of uh, individuals and uh, town residents that, you know, I feel like they should have a say in it. Um, so I. I will vote. Uh, I'll move no action at this time. No action or table. No, no action. E I, either one. I'd, I'd vote for a no action. S I'll second that. And and if I could just say, um, not, I'm not trying to discourage the process, but I liken this too when we had issues with snow plowing. I know I sat on a committee and we brought in the uh, and town manager, Mr. Rademacher, who was there, and we brought in um, the people that were getting demonized on the streets, the big bad subcontractors, and guess what? We came up with a great plan that worked in terms of cutting back corners and getting the bike path plowed. And when we went through the leaf blower um, issue, I know Mr. Greeley and I, and again, the previous people cited. I have to bring these things up. I have to, but what I'm saying is, I see this as that sort of an issue, and how do we get it so that in the end, it's, it's we have the actual product that we want. So the reason why I'm, I'm supporting um, Mr. Burns' motion and also saying it's not undoable. And believe me, I know contracting, getting all, everybody down with the leaf blower issue, which really sort of, you know, got the town out a very strong feeling both ways. I think in the end th that Mr. Greeley and I and others, we came up with, first of all, we sat down with all those contractors, landscapers that we were demonizing, heard from them, and we crafted the best possible compromise and I want to kind of replicate that what we did with big bad snowplow contract subcontractors big bad landscapers I'd like to and and I'm not asking you all to do anything that um, I haven't done myself and and, and and I think it's a good thing I think you'll all meet and and, uh, and I'm not saying you have to meet a lot ask mr. Chaplain I'm meeting meeting subcommittee meeting phobia um, I don't see why you couldn't get it done maybe in one or two meetings so um, that's why I'm seconding the motion okay mr. Hero. I'm not prepared to support a vote of no action. I, I would feel more comfortable if we tabled this for one for one meeting and try to get answers. Some of these questions specifically, a, a better bead on what the cost is to um, the individuals looking to to, um, to build on their property would have to would trigger the bylaw. The answer to the cost on on the um, on the the tree warden's time and what that would indicate for a potential uh, permit fee. Potentially some recommendations around the the, um, the the fees and fines here, and uh, maybe a, a clearer just timeline of what this adds to a project a project's timeline, which I think would probably have to be developed in conjunction with um, you know contractors, professional builders, uh, to to have a good accurate one. If if we could table this for one meeting and have that information in front of us, I, I feel like it would be a um, a more balanced vote. I mean, we would have the information we're looking for to, to make the decision. Mr. Dunn. Uh, I similarly am not ready to vote uh, no action at this time. Uh, I would like to get this done somehow. Um, I would, I think it would be, I would love to hear more about what the, but what are the things that are standing between us and yes and seeing what, if we can ask the committee or other, or other groups to come to them. Um, I think that seeking the input from the developers or and other affected people, I agree, is, is something that's really important and, and, and needs to be included in this. Uh, one thought that I just had is uh, we just like go through the last 15 demo permits and call each person with a five, with say, you know, here's, do you operate in Lexington? Do you operate under this? What if Arlington pulled a, created a law like this? What would you think? And just try to figure out what flaws it's got that we can fix before it gets to town meeting. So um, I've actually even willing to give it more time, I think, Mr. Caro, than one yeah. more meeting. And then even, and I'm even w willing to say, you know, it could be something like uh, we're not, uh, it doesn't make the print deadline for our report and we, we issue a supplemental or something like that. If, the, if that's what it takes, uh, you know, it, this is an unusual enough issue. That, uh, but I, and I'll tell you, the things that really motivate me are the photos of, I can't even remember the name of the street. Is it Spring Valley? The one that's on uh, Spring Lower Valley, Mystic. Yes, with uh, all the like that's just one of those things. That, like you shouldn't build like that. There's just mm -hmm. no reason that you should take down all those trees uh, before you do that. It's you know everybody on that on that uh, lake you know is 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 missing those trees uh, for the water quality, for the visual aesthetics, and all those things. And uh, 
uh, without demonizing. I just don't think that should have happened. And uh, for those reasons, I, I want to get it done. So I come down on the say I want to get this done. I, I think I think there's the root of a great That's idea. the what I didn't I want know, to say, know, the root. <laughs> but, but, you know, uh, so, uh, the, you know, you mentioned that the leap blows things, but I really want to hear from a developer. So, I mean, I really feel that's important. Those that this most directly affects, or a homeowner as well, who's going through this process, uh, but when we had the leap blows, we included those who wanted absolutely a complete ban against them and, uh, you know, the professional landscapers who use them the most. Um, and and we, we, that took us a year. I, I don't want this to take us a year. But so right now we have Mr. Burns' motion of no action seconded by Mrs. Mahan. So let me take that vote, which I think is about to fail, and then let me see well, if there's yeah, another motion. I, I, I'll, um, I see how this is going. I'll, I'll pull that motion, but I, I do think that it's important that we get all of this information, um, you know, as quick, uh, as quickly as possible, but at the same point um, that enough work, you know, can go into it so we don't just get this information hastily enact a, a policy. I, I think that there's, you know, there has to be a, a bit of a deeper dive um, before we do implement something. So you're completely- Can we move to table versus post? Can we move to table, which means move to table, no time set, yeah. and if and when the time comes that we get all this information and we're ready to support it, we could take it off the table and support it. If we move to postpone, I don't want to give them an unfair burden of getting all these things yeah. done in two weeks. So if, can- I, that, I think that's completely reasonable. Can I second reasonable. your motion I'm to happy table? To do that. Is that okay? Yeah. Okay. I think we are willing to take a two-week deadline. <laughs> you think what, Susan? I, I think we would well, if, agree to a two-week deadline. Yeah. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll. Table. What doesn't? Hmm. So if you're ready in two weeks, you're ready in two weeks. Okay. We're just tabling. We're not. We're not tabling to a time specific. Okay. All right. Sorry. So all those in favor of the motion by Mrs. Mahan, seconded by Mr. Byrne. Yes. Was it right? mm -hmm. uh, uh, to table. Please signify by saying aye. 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 Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Appreciate Thank you. it. Mm -hmm. The good news is the next one won't take so long. <laughs> <laughs> Don't say that. Not, it could. It could. There's not any strong feelings on this one either. <laughs> <laughs> yes. When you call it to order, if you could call on me after you announce what it is. Uh, the next, the uh, next article. Yeah, you're yeah, saying? Yeah. Yes. Okay. So, all right. So the next article is Article 30, the transfer of town property one Gilboa Road. So, to see if the town will vote to transfer the ownership and care and custody of the land and structures located at One Gilboa Road, currently owned by the town of Arlington, to the Arlington Housing Authority, for the perpetual use of the same for affordable housing purposes and compliant with all terms and conditions, such that the affordable housing developed and occupied thereon meets the Commonwealth's requirement for inclusion in the town's subsidized housing in inventory, and further, to authorize the Board of Selectmen and any other municipal entity required by law to seek the approval of the General Court, all as required by Article 97 of the Massachusetts Declaration of Rights to remove said one Gilboa Road from the protection of Article 97 and as permitted by Article 97, authorize the placement of a conservation restriction or other instrument protecting an equivalent or greater land area for conservation purposes identified as a portion or total of the Arlington's Great Meadow and located Lexington, Massachusetts, or rather sufficient land area identified by the town. And further, to authorize the Board of Selectmen to take whatever steps are necessary to accomplish and fulfill the goals of this article or take any action related thereto, inserted at the request of John Belskis and 10 registered voters who I'll call on in a minute, Mr. Dunn. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my house is within 500 feet of the Gilboa house, and my back windows look out on the conservation land. I'm going to recuse myself from this vote. Luck. <laughs> how, many, how many trees do you see out that window? <laughs> John. John. Tingling with anticipation, buddy. For those who have forgotten who I am, John Belskis, town meeting member, Precinct 18, and the author of 
this particular Warren article. Uh, I've been to two other board meetings. I met with the Finance Committee. I don't know if they've offered any opinions back to the Select Board. And I've met with the Conservation Committee, and I'm aware of the decision that they came to and provided to the Board. Uh, you all know I have a thing about 40B. You say, well, what's this got to do with transferring land? Unfortunately, it has to do with uh, our protection against 40B. Uh, I provided you a small package, uh, about 20 minutes reading. Uh, you've been so busy tonight, I won't bother testing you on it. We'll just refer to it if we come up with any questions on this. So let's get to Article 30 and what it brings to the board. Uh, I formulated this with the aid of a few citizens and thankfully town council uh, and we are fortunate to have Doug as our town council because his involvement involvement and willingness to participate uh, he really brings a lot of good to the town thank you uh, so where am I with this first off I gave you a lot of detail about my feelings about 40 B uh, we're inheriting this because of a, a lack of participation by the state legislature, but that's something that we don't have total control of. Uh, Arlington has probably done more than most towns as far as affordable housing. Uh, I met with the state inspector general about a year ago, uh, gave him the details. Uh, we were working on another bill, but gave him the details of what we've done here in Arlington with the Housing Corporation. Uh, the bylaws were passed, which we can't get the legislature to get out of committee. We have perpetuity of all the units that are developed under a uh, comprehensive permit. Uh, that, that's not in the state regulations. We can't get it in the state regulations. Uh, we offered inclusionary zoning as a, a means for improving our affordable housing performance. Uh, we can't get that out of committee <laughs> at the State House either. Uh, interestingly enough, I've, I've placed the bill two sessions in a row now, seeking to emulate what Connecticut has already done, which raises the ante, ante on 40B and that the developers will have to provide at least 30% of the units as affordable, as opposed to the meager 20 and 25% that they currently work under. I guess it's about the fifth or sixth 40B type article I put before this board. You've always supported me in the past, and interestingly enough, the town meeting has supported me on those articles. Uh, some of them get lost because they don't take effect right away. Uh, one of my interesting experiences at the Conservation Commission was after all the discussion about the impact of this article or how they felt about it, uh, the last item that they came to after their vote that they provided to you people was a bylaw that we passed back in 2002, I believe, uh, that, that would have gone a long way to helping some of this stuff in that uh, it stipulated to the Conservation Commission when they receive a major project uh, can nail the developer for, well, if we're not going to have any problems with the wetlands, and this is very important down at uh, the Mugar site, if you're going to clean it up so we're not going to have any problems, you'll have no problem posting a bond of 20% of the value of the project, which the town will keep for five years. And if we don't have any problems, then we're assured that your plan was right. If you do have problems, the owner of the property affected has means to recover the damages. I'm hoping, though they didn't take a vote on it, uh, some of them seem surprised that it even existed. I'm hoping that they will take a vote on it when we get around to the Mugar project coming before the ZBA because I think that'll be very meaningful in the, project, in the process. A little bit about the SHI process, substitute, uh, the subsidized housing inventory. Uh, that's the process that I focused on when I get involved in this, uh, and what led me to One Gilboa Road. I do a 
and I've provided you folks the numbers before you've supported, supported it. Uh, you've even supported it to the fact that we brought it before the ZBA and said, Arlington's surpassed the 1.5, we should be able to deny a permit. Totally comfortable? No, because the thing has a lot of side aspects that we don't always know about. Uh, how I got to One Gilboa Road, part of my manual research, and this is going manually through all the records involved, the town assessor's records, uh, I look at what the state has, what the federal government has, uh, registry of deeds listings, because there, there are discrepancies. And that's when I come up with Mount Gilboa, and I, and I go and look at the deeds that are recorded at the registry. Uh, the land of One Gilboa is R1 property, owned by the town of Arlington. And here's where we run into problems. There is nothing on any of the related documents that indicate that this is protected by Article 97. Uh, and that's a concern. Doug, fortunately, when we were putting this together, my original article didn't have 97 in it. He said, look, if this could be a problem. Why don't we come up with a process that expedites the ability to do this? And I went along with that, but maybe I'll be filing a, subst a substitute motion on this come town meeting, depending on what happens here this evening. Uh, I spent a couple of hours today talking with people at the Department of Environmental Protection. Uh, one of them was the author of one of the pieces in your uh, folder uh, about town obligations in order to protect conservation land. I hate to tell you folks, and I hate to tell the Conservation Commission, we have not done a good job. This stuff is not recorded the way it should be recorded to keep it as conservation land. Uh, that's a scary thing. Because there are, in addition, I have some other pieces I think should be under conservation protection. Because we do need the land, we need the open space, uh, and we should be protecting it. Uh, it's not protected. And there's been law cases about it. But the people at DEP are pretty emphatic that unless this stuff is recorded, one of the comments that came up and Doug brought to my attention, he said, well, if it was ordered at if it was ordered a town meeting when they purchased this that it was to be conservation land, so be it. Unfortunately, it never got in the recorded deed. Now that's not a hopeless case. That can be fixed. I talked to the author of one of the documents in your folder that said we can fix this. But when we talked about what I was doing and why I was doing it, she said, "Gee, you've got a win-win situation." You can, in fact, keep it as conservation land with the house on it dedicated as affordable. I think the words were, a conservation restriction can cover all or part of a property. So we can say, okay, this is our affordable housing unit. And what I was looking to gain was the acreage involved because that goes with the house and it adds to our base. Is at the end of the story, uh, there's things that we haven't done here in Arlington that we should be doing. Uh, and it's not just Arlington. The state is also remiss. I went through Secretary Galvin's office. We got two very important aides from him. Uh, we've been trying for years to find out how many units of 40B housing were created in the state, and they were reluctant to release it. Don't ask me why. But we've long had suspicions about the numbers that are quoted by the various agencies about how many units have been created by 40B. It's a sad story. You know, they told us there's 59,000 units of affordable housing developed with 40B. When you, when you look at the Excel spreadsheet they provided me, probably could have been done by a high school senior. It was loaded with duplications, same property, over and over and over, contributing to this 59,000. You take that out, oh my God, we're down below 45,000. 
And in addition, they have all the rental property in there. People tend to forget the rental property is counted 100% as affordable, but only 20% of the units have to be affordable. So what are the other 80%? Why, they're market rate. So if I take that number out, it appears we're somewhere in the order of a little over 34,000 units in the 47 years of its existence. And if you annualize it, 40B is produced two units of housing per each city and town in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts in 47 years. And that's sad. And we can't get bills through the legislature. John, so right now, the appearance John, is John, that... John, sorry. Thank you for all that, but we, what what you want an article? What is it you want to do? I want Not what we haven't done or what the state, please. Okay. Right, sorry. Fair, fair thing. You've been through a lot tonight. Well, <laughs> I, I think there's a lot that okay. also have something uh, to say. So. My point is, why not do the transfer? Why not have that available as part of our base? And talking to the people at DEP, it is within our power as a town. We still have our hands on this. We can move it any way we want. We no, in no way jeopardize the conservation aspect. So I guess I'd like to see us go forward with the transfer. We still own it as a town. Hopefully we can work with the Conservation Commission and make sure they understand what has to be done to protect all their conservation property, which is not protected today. Right. Thank you for the time. Hopefully a consideration is favorable. Right. So two questions I'd like to ask. Does Housing Authority want it? Have you spoken with them? It was kind of a chicken and egg thing. I got to find out whether you people, how you feel about it. Could they have a, a different opinion? I don't know. I'm perfectly willing to go to them once I have a sense that this could possibly happen or it will get to town meeting on the basis that it's something that we're very much interested in doing. They, I know there are issues about the house. Uh, it needs a lot of work. Uh, yeah. How do we fund that? I'm curious whatever. whether they'd even want yeah. it. Okay. Uh, it's rental property right now. Right. Yep. Okay. Uh, Thank you. Whether the individual there qualifies as a, for an affordable, that's another issue. Okay. Thank you. Doug, uh, what about the issue of the, it's not protected conservation land? Or? So, you know, I think that John and I have a respectful disagreement here. The uh, <coughs> town meeting vote reflects that it was meant to be uh, conservation land, very specifically. Uh, I don't, I, I think you may be right that it's not recorded. Mount Gilboa was acquired actually over a period of over 25 years. It's not, it was all, wasn't all acquired at one time. Some of it was acquired by eminent domain. Some of it was acquired by uh, nego third party negotiated uh, transaction. In this case, we acquired it from the Arlington um, we required it from the Trust for Public Land. Um, and the town meeting's vote is, is pretty clear to me that it provides enough evidence that an Article 90, because Article 97 specifically doesn't say anything about deed restriction. Article 97 just says property acquired for this purpose falls under Article 97. Now, there's a case that John, I think, is aware of that references the issue of what happens when it's not recorded. But in that case, the acquisition by that town meeting specifically said that it had to be recorded and it wasn't. So I think there might be some dispute about it. In my mind, it's at, at, at a bare minimum. While I think it is Article 97 protected, respectfully, I think that at a bare minimum, you wouldn't want to proceed with this type of transaction without following all the steps required by Article 97 because you'd be prone to litigation about it and a lot of uncertainty for the Arlington Housing Authority, for us. So I, I think that it's protected by Article 97. I understand that there is some legal dispute about this. but. In my opinion, uh, we would want to follow all the steps in order to make sure that Article 97 was complied with. Okay. All right. So first to my colleagues, questions, comments, anybody? Nothing? Uh, I think I'd like to hear from Thank the you. proponents. Okay. Okay. All right. Thank but, you. Uh, as long as it's not repetitive for each <laughs> proponent. Right. <laughs> so who would like to speak on this matter? One person. Well, hello. hello. Who would like to speak on this matter? 
Please come up and stand in line behind the uh, microphone. Uh, give your name and address, and if you would, your position. Hi. Hello. Good evening. Kristen Show, 93 Madison. Um, thank you for hearing um, all the sides. I understand it has to be weighed. I just want to be crystal clear that woods and open space are crucial. It's like Frank uh, Frederick Law Olmsted with Central Park in New York. I know that Arlington's a far cry from Manhattan, but it's important to protect those spaces. So I re um, respectfully request a no action for tonight. You know, it wasn't actually Frederick, but you know the Olmsted Agency designed the gardens out I know, there. I okay. know. He's all over. Okay. Yeah, no. Okay. Shout Thank out. You. Thank you. Next. Uh, John Gersh, Kipling Road. I would like to say this does seem like a win-win situation to me and that I don't think any harm will come to Mount Gilboa and could stand to protect Arlington from 40B development, which has been sort of a blight, as far as I can tell, on the whole town, the entire town, that is all. What, whoa, whoa, whoa. what's the blight? We don't have any 40B, what's the oh, blight? You don't have to look any further than the development that's like at the bike path and, and, and Brattle Street that is, I mean, the nature of the development that I've observed is you shoehorn as much in as you, oh, oh, you can. The 40B yeah. by right, the, right, yes, right, right. Brattle okay. Street. Yeah. Okay, no, thank Sorry. you. No, no, I forgot that, yeah. Yes. My name is Charlie Dosovich. I'm with uh, Precinct 21. Um, I'm on Westmoreland Avenue and Westminster. Uh, my children walk through um, the woods through Mount Gamboa, a uh, 10-minute walk um, to Pierce Elementary School, um, which we lost <clears throat> the conservation land at this point. Um, it's a loss for the town and for the next generation. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Bye. Um, my name is Genevieve Oba. I live at 42 Summit Street. My kids also go to Pierce Elementary, and I'm in Precinct 21. Um, I'm in those woods every day, as are my boys, as were they this afternoon. Um, I really, you know, when I thought, when I first moved to Arlington 12 years ago, one of the things that attracted me to Arlington was the amount of green space that is in this town. Um, and I certainly decided to stay in this town and move closer to woods because of their existence. The current structure that, that's there is very unassuming. It sort of blends right into the woods. Um, I just don't think that it makes sense to transfer it to um, affordable housing. I don't think it makes sense to pit these two against each other. Conservation and affordable housing should, it doesn't, it just, yeah, it's, <laughs> it's upsetting to me. So I really hope that you vote no action. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm Sue Dockro. I live on Westminster Ave. I wrote you a letter. I'm going to try not to repeat it. Um, just first of all, as a resident, obviously I want to protect the conservation land that I see from my house, but I have broader reasons for opposing this. Um, I did want to say that I really admire um, Mr. Belska's commitment to this issue. Um, I know his intentions are good, but I feel that this just isn't the right solution for our town. Um, I feel like removing even just this 1.7 acres from conservation protection will make the character of the woods vulnerable. Um, I understand that the proponent has no intention of removing the house, uh, but I think he can't promise that. When the land is removed, when the protection's removed, anything can happen, really. Um, it's been unclear to me, too, if the state would accept a 1.7 acre lot with one house as evidence for commitment to affordable housing. Because, I mean, my house is on a lot that's a tenth of that. And that's a lot more typical of the density of the community. So I'm concerned about that, you know, whether it would be a questionable claim, one house on such a large lot. Um, the other thing is that I think the effect of this transfer on our 1.53% our would be pretty small. Um, the, so I'm using these numbers, 3.41 acres of affordable housing divided by 18, 93.9 acres of allowable residential land. I think those are the town figures. And that's how we get 1.53%. So if you use those numbers, um, 1.7 acres is 0.09%. So it's, it's not really increasing it a lot. Um, so I'm, I would oppose this plan even if it were 5%. So you know, I'm really speaking 
it, it doesn't really matter if it's only 0.09% to me, but um, you know, the prospect that would only add 0.09%, it just makes the justification even less convincing. Um, and then the, the last thing I wanted to say is that at the Conservation um, Commission meeting, Mr. Belskis explained that our ho affordable housing percentage is fluid. You know, property can be taken out of affordable housing. It could drop back down. Um, but he also said that there's several pending projects that aren't included. And um, I hope I understood correctly. Um, I think what he said is that he thought those pending projects could bring it up to about 2%. So, and I know that there's a development on my street, Westminster, which was not included in the 1.53. So, I guess my point is that given that we've achieved 1.53 and that we have other projects, you know, kind of lined up to contribute to that, um, I would hope that adding 0.09% is not considered important enough to justify a loss of conservation protection because this is really a unique wooded space um, in our town. So thank you very much, and I hope that you'll consider a vote of no action. Thank you, Sue. A completely new side to this argument, right? No. <laughs> I, still, I wish. Still love I'm you. sorry. Ahead. My name is Jean Diaz, and I live at 79 Crescent Hill Avenue, just two blocks away just two blocks down from Mount Gilboa um, and the house and the conservation land. And I moved to Arlington specifically because of the trees and I appreciate the conversation about the trees and the con conservation land, specifically being right in the midst between Great Meadows and Mount Gilboa and the reservoir. And I have a deep appreciation for what that brings to the quality of life in Arlington. And therefore, I, I, I do appreciate also Mr. Belsky's um, concern for, and your uh, concern um, on the board for the uh, affordable housing in Arlington, but I also am very concerned that this article would put into jeopardy the land that is conservation land there right now, and so I recommend a, um, a not supporting this warrant going forward. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, I got into line, but I'm hearing a lot of the same arguments that I'm, I'm probably gonna make. My name is Elizabeth Kostajan. I live on Westminster Ave. Um, I think I was surprised to hear that Arlington would consider changing conservation land into housing of any kind. And I was really disappointed and surprised because I think we have such gems of green space. You know, Monotomy Rocks Park, Mount Gilboa, they're just, they're just gorgeous spaces that a lot, some towns don't even have. And, and I was just surprised to even contemplate putting any changes or additional housing in, in such, a, um, such a, uh, a valuable asset. And then I also wanted to reiterate I think um, uh, Mrs. Doctorow's point of the how little this would really make a difference to housing, but how big a difference it would make to Arlington, because um, again, working with the numbers that um, Mr. Bel Belskis provided, I came with the calculation that it would um, increase our our uh, percentage by six or actually seven hundredths of a percent. You know, point zero zero. Zero six seven, you know. That, so it's so marginal, in, and it's not really making a huge difference in affecting housing. But you know, where we're putting it is is really going to affect town, I think, in a really negative way. So, I just wanted to point that out. Thank you. We got you. that. Oh. Thank you. Hi, my name is Dr. Brenda Phillips. I live at 82 Orient Ave. I'm a developmental and cognitive psychologist, so I approach this from a personal level in that I live only two blocks from the park and utilize it on a daily basis. Um, my daughter attends Pierce School, so we, we walk the adjoining space of the park to school um, every day. And so um, I'm concerned. I attended the conservation committee meeting, and I heard the argument and um, certainly support affordable housing, I think, is an issue that we need to address. Uh, at the same time, it concerns me greatly, but we're talking about one unit, um, and as the argument has been made, um, it doesn't seem to make a lot of sense to move on this to uh, 
move the conservation land or remove uh, that status um, given that and given also that the housing authority has not supported this warrant I mean I haven't that same question was posed at the con at the conservation committee meeting um, and I'm, I'm surprised that there's not an answer on that question this evening um, that being said from an empirical standpoint there's about 20 years of good solid research tightly controlled studies that show um, having access to uh, trees having access to nature is very important uh, for children's development and adult development as well. And what's particularly interesting about this research is that it's not about being immersed in nature, but simply having the access to that landscape. So the fact that children at Pierce School look out onto that hillside every day, I guarantee has, I don't have data to back that up. I'd be happy to run a study to look at that. But I guarantee you it would, it would show that they are getting some benefit because there are studies that show that children who play outside at recess at schools that have access to views of trees perform better in school. So it's not only about their social emotional development, it's about their cognitive development and cognitive gains in the classroom. So um, I know it's late. I will stop there. No, so, Doctor, <laughs> thank, thank you. you. Um, what about the uh, social uh, development of the members of this board here that you've observed tonight? You want well, to <laughs> I'm. Oh, oh, you're done. I'm no, actually. No, no, no. Danger. You're danger. her favorite. Danger. You're her favorite. I will say one thing. I'm surprised you're not drinking coffee because I believe it's going to be a late coffee. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Actually, you know, my father served on this board for 19 years. Actually, 1974 was the last year. But you can't see, but up here we have cabinets. Literally, they had alcohol oh. in those cabinets. <laughs> they smoked. So they you can smoked. imagine as these meetings went on with that one. <laughs> Sir, sorry, please. Rob Carter, I residence at 31 Summit Street, which is on the slopes of Mount Gilboa. I moved there, bought, my wife and I bought a house there because of that conservation land, and that was 1988, which was a while ago. And we were dues-paying members of the Mount Gilboa Neighborhood Association that was instrumental in, uh, in obtaining that top parcel, and we support that. And I, I, I'm a firm believer there's a reason in 40B for trading off units for land. You know, there's a one, land area and units get traded off because if you have the land area reserved, it's possible to build on it in the future. And so I voice that concern. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Yes, hi. Good evening, Allison Norton, 6 Crescent Hill Avenue. Um, I'm sorry, where which? 6 Crescent Hill Avenue. <laughs> thank you, uh, Crescent Hill, yep, thank I, you. I will be repetitive, I apologize, but I will be quick. Uh, I live one house away from the woods, so it's very important to me that these are conserved. I also work with a lot of disadvantaged people, people who are homeless, don't have a lot of money for housing. So both these issues are very important to me. At the end of the day, it just doesn't seem to be a great benefit to the people who need the affordable housing to potentially lose the conservation status. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Suzanne McLeod. I live at 61 Madison. Um, a lot of the thoughts I have have been spoken. I'm impressed with the amount of research that's gone into both sides of this and have been reading and reading and learning and learning, it doesn't seem to me that the, the benefits of transferring the property outweigh the costs. It's, it appears to me to be short-sighted. It does encourage me to think more creatively, and I hope everybody, about how to do kind of the kinds of projects that were done at Westminster earlier this year. Uh, existing properties, existing developed land be made into affordable housing. I don't see that the Mount Gilboa land will benefit affordable housing as much as it will cost all of us emotionally and also wildlife habitat it's it's part of a corridor i see a lot of coyotes turkeys raccoons fisher cats hawks owls it's important land so i i urge a no action vote thank you thank you hi good evening uh thank you for your time my name is chris rowell uh actually moved to arlington about a month and a half ago uh, we live at 88 westminster ave uh, i'm really excited to be here in the town um, certainly not excited to hear that we're going to lose conservation land as uh as that was one of our later <laughs> one of our major reasons to uh to to uh move here was the balance to have uh, access to public transportation um, the Arlington Heights uh, shops that are in walking distance as well as a balance on the other side of the street of having conservation land where we can take our dog and uh, take our, our seven-month-old daughter who will soon be, be toddling around up there. 
Uh, so uh, I support all the comments from my, my neighbors. I also want to point out that hasn't been discussed yet is that the transfer of land potential from Arlington to another community of Lexington seems um, really awkward and uh, I don't see how moving something from, from here to there benefits our community. So uh, again, I am against uh, the article. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome to Arlington. Thanks. <laughs> Hang around. I don't believe that land is going anywhere myself. <laughs> Sir? I'm an Arlington uh, resident for almost 10 years and uh, have the same reaction and uh, the con extreme concern about this property being uh, brought out of conservation. And one of the issues that came up in the Conservation Commission, and forgive me if I don't voice this as articulately, is that it's the parcel in the middle that's involved with the potential movement out of conservation and what, and what could happen to that parcel of land once it's out of conservation is any, is is out of the control of conservation. But it would affect the surrounding parcels as I understand it. And so you would maximize the, you know, uh, that's, it would affect the parcels around that property. So for, to get one piece of, uh, to get one more unit of affordable housing, you're affecting and in effect fragmenting this contiguous piece of land. So I certainly vote for no action. Okay, thank you. Hi. I'm Pam Hallett. I'm executive director of the Housing Corporation. I also happen to be tenant at uh, the Gilboa House. Um, but I don't want to speak about that part of it. What I do want to say, though, is I find it a little bit underhanded to try and keep layering uh, all kinds of vacant land into to be able to defeat 40B. Uh, we have a thousand households on our waiting list that are desperately looking for affordable housing. We were talking earlier that tonight about the fact that we have homeless living in Arlington. What we ought to be doing is looking at how we can create more affordable housing in areas that need to be redeveloped because they're underutilized at this point. And I think that is really important to take to heart here in this discussion. Um, I also want to say that the house does need a lot of work and that I know from experience, particularly in last year's winter, that being stuck up there is really difficult. I have an all-wheel drive vehicle. Anyone who has to walk down that driveway or drive without all-wheel drive will be really in a difficult situation trying to get out of there in a bad storm. So, you know, putting a, a less wealthy family there would put an undue burden on them, I, I believe. Um, and I also think that people need to know that the neighborhood sort of walks through the land every day. I must see minimum 50 people, dogs, children. It's wonderful. Elderly, families. But they do walk right up the driveway, right through my backyard, um, and right down into the land, which you know, I don't have a problem with. Sometimes people complain that they can see in my windows, but you know, that's their problem, not mine. <laughs> um, so, um, but I do think you, ha you need to look at this in sort of a holistic way, is it is not appropriate for someone that doesn't have resources to live there. Um, and I think you need to just be careful about sort of trying to solve one problem by messing up a really beautiful resource that this town has. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. Hi, good evening. My name is Jennifer Brown. I'm at 51 Orient Ave. Um, I think my stance on the issue is that I moved here in August. And the reason why I moved here was because of the green space and access to pu public transit that's available within Arlington. From, for me, I don't actually have children in the Arlington school systems are fantastic and that's a huge draw for a lot of people but for me the draw was actually the reservoir and Mount Gaboa which is why I chose to move to that neighborhood um, additionally as I've come to appreciate it's just a fantastic neighborhood um, I have amazing neighbors <laughs> who I am getting to know very rapidly um, so thank you thank you thanks for choosing Arlington Roy Goldstein from Westminster Avenue. I don't want to be repetitive as to what has already been said. I wrote you a letter as well, which outlines some points. But I wanted to bring up just one, one really important issue that, I, that keeps coming to mind, which is in Arlington, we are uh, a little scarce in our open space. And that which we have is so much of it is parcelated. And, and Gilboa and Turkey 
hill exists as the largest parcels, about equal 10.7 acres. So if we take a piece of it away, we were, we're de this, this detriment to it. And I think it's rare that we have these large parcels still in existence. And I think that's a really important point that we just leave it be as it is. Um, I've been appreciating that land for about 36 years. I, when, even when I lived in Somerville, I used to come over and was the reason I came to Arlington. I, I looked at topographic maps to look for open space, came and saw Gilboa, and I actually live on, on, on adjacent to it now, but it's just purely by just seeking it out. And I'd hate to see anything happen to that parcel at all. So you were trespassing in those days, were you? Well, no, no, because the seven and a half acres around it's were already, yeah, yeah. I'm kidding, it's public, it's public. Uh, so, uh, just so you know, I'm sure I received more than 30 emails and letters and stuff, so apologies that wasn't, even, I knew we were coming to this hearing, uh, but apologies, I, I couldn't respond to them all, my colleagues probably did, but Mrs. Mahan. Um, I'm just gonna try to see if I can go in uncharted territories here. I would like to first make a motion to table and then just explain the, um, the background behind it. I'll second for discussion. Just yeah. for discussion, yep. That's, I totally understand that. Um, first and foremost, what I've been hearing a lot of um, is that does the Housing Authority want this? Um, have they discussed it? I spoke with somebody informally um, who didn't give an opinion either way, but said you know they would be happy to consider it. The reason why I would want that discussion to table it, I mean to table it, to, to have that discussion to see A, um, if the interest was there, B, if they could come back with what we're going to do is um, take over the property that's there, leave the land that's there, and perhaps upgrade um, Mount Kilboa that's there, or not. They may look at it and say, you know what, we can take it, we, we're good, we could keep the conservation land, but we can't afford to do the upgrades. So I'd, I'd like to hear from the Housing Authority, and that could probably be done with it before our next meeting, in terms of if, if this is something they would consider, what they could legally um, say, what they would or would not do with the conservation land, and uh, as well as I'd like to give um, Town Council and uh, Mr. Belskis time to explore whether this is an Article 97 uh, procedure or whether there's the ro road of um, further defining the conservation restriction to um, uh, protect the affordable, designate, designate and protect the house on Mount Cabo as affordable housing as well as the conservation restriction to protect the open land. And the reason I say that is I, why do I want to go through this exercise, I'm not trying to tax everybody and come to more meetings, is that you know, looking at where we are, I think you'd be hard pressed to find, and I want to be really careful what I say about my remarks, I don't think you'd find anybody on behalf of the town that will tell you any specific number that we're at, um, whether it's above or below 1.5%. We do have a very serious issue down in East Arlington, same issues, homeless, people walk through there, kids walk through there, that if that development goes in there, I will say my, th that it's gonna have a detrimental effect to one third um, of Arlington itself. Um, if, if this is an exercise we can go through and everybody can come out that Housing Authority wants it, they commit to keeping it the way it is in terms of in, if that's doable legally, as well as perhaps looking at what needs to be done to the house. And I just wanna say, not to be a stickler, but in terms of anyone who could rent up at Mount Caboa. I grew up in low income. I grew up in assisted living. I grew up in the projects, didn't know it was a manor. We didn't have a car, we didn't have anything, and we got around, including, you know, up and down to my parents were able to come up and secure and walk up the hill, not only when we were born at Sims, my sister was born in Sims Hospital, but I remember going to Mount Caboa. So I don't, I'm gonna respectfully disagree that you need a, Toyota forerunner or anything, you know, to be living up there. I think, you know, as long as you qualify. So the reason I want to table is I want to hear from the housing authority. They may come back and say, no, we have no interest, or this may be something doable, and I think that can be done within two weeks. But I would just like to table. Okay, Mr. Caro. I think, in the interest of fairness, I will I will go along with the motion to table as we we gave the same consideration. I think to the proponent of the last article, and we asked for more information. I will say that I'm very skeptical about this article, though. Um, <clears throat> I'm a little bit confused because I actually, in the, the presentation of, of materials that we received up up till tonight, it, it appeared that we were talking about the entire property, and it, and it sounds like we're actually talking about the home 
itself and the and the um, the, the land around it. But but I am concerned. I'm the, the the term parcelization. I'm concerned about that about that. I think the other question that I'd like to see answered though is that you know, currently we do rent out that 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 property when it becomes vacant we, we put it out for for bids we have in the past I know we've housed refugees from Katrina there so is there any reason that a transfer would have to happen for that to be considered in our stock of affordable housing Mr. Chairman, may I? Yeah, yeah, there's, there's, been so. a, there's been a couple of questions that I'm hoping that I can curtail. There seems to be more issues floating in the air than maybe there, there, there really should be uh, with respect to a few of these things. So the answer to that question, Mr. Kuro, is that in order to qualify as affordable housing for the subsidized housing uh, inventory, which is relevant to the 1.5% calculation for yep. 40B yep. purposes, it has to be deed restricted. Re deed restricted. It doesn't have to be in perpetuity, but it does have to be deed restricted for that specific purpose which is not something that is currently in place now, and in my opinion, um, is not uh, compatible with its current status. In my view, uh, respectfully to folks, I don't think the Article 97 status is going to change with more research. I think it is, in my opinion, it's an Article 97 protected, protected land. It may not be recorded, but the vote of town meeting was extremely clear that it was voted for conservation purposes and that absent a litigation about it, I don't think that we'd be in a, in a, in a, in a posture to assert very comfortably that it's, that it's not. I don't mean that, I just don't wanna lead anybody down the primrose path. I think that in order to make Mr. Belsky's vision for what he wants to do with this parcel happen, you would have to have a vote of town meeting, you would have to, uh, at a minimum, get the legislature's approval, as well as the Conservation Commission's unanimous approval. So, and, and I'm sorry, one more uh, quick thing. So the 1.5% calculation was done, just for everybody to have clear on the record, it was done by the planning department, it was submitted to the ZBA, and the ZBA took a vote to assert that they had that 1.5% safe harbor status. What I think Ms. Mahan and, Ms. Belsk and Mr. Belskis and a lot of other folks are noting is very true, is that that 1.5% uh, is subject to ebbing and flowing, and that Mr. Belskis's proposal is about ensuring the town's um, long-term status because the calculation for one and a half percent is extremely complicated it's not the math of it is, is not just a simple adding up of the total amount of land there's a lot that goes into it that I won't uh, put Mr. Krawski on the spot to, to, to discuss but it, it, it probably would have an impact on it but that doesn't but the policy discussion that folks are having I think is the really central issue do we want to assure the status of the property that Ms. Arling, uh, Ms. Mahan's making reference to, which is, is in jeopardy of development in fit by, by removing this property from conservation restriction. Yeah, yeah. And I'm sorry that's a long-winded answer. I know everybody's been here for a long time tonight, but I just wanted to at least try to make sure that, that, that a few points that I think are beyond dispute at this point in time. No, thank you. I have two follow-ups with the Chair's permission. I mean, firstly, if, it's, if it is deemed conservation property, why are we permitted to operate a rental property there now at all? So when the house was acquired, when the property was acquired, the house was already there. And I've actually combed through the transcripts of that town meeting discussion. Um, the fact that it's conservation land and there was a pre-existing house there doesn't necessarily preclude that pre-existing house's continued use. And there's been a lot of discussion over many town meetings over the last decade and a half about what to do with that house. There's been talk about lifting that house up and moving it somewhere. There's been talk about demolishing the house so that it's just an open park without that house there. But it's in somewhat, uh, I wouldn't say it's a unique situation, but it's because the house was already there when it was acquired for conservation purposes that we're allowed to essentially rent it out as a rental. Doing something more with it, especially something that required a change to its deed status, is what, in my mind, triggers the Article 97 protections. Okay, and to that, to that point, and in the, in the issue that Mr. Belskis raised, I understand that we can assert our our um, Article 97 rights um, around that property. Would it not be advisable, though, to pr pursue the deed correction to, to strengthen that? A absolutely. So all these other issues notwithstanding, if it's not recorded in a deed, there's actually a relatively uh, straightforward process for any parcel that we're concerned wasn't um, properly deed restricted. Part of what probably happened, and this is just a guess because this was quite some time ago, is that because it was passed to us from the uh, Trust for Public Land, 
there was probably an assumption that that was clear enough that it didn't require a conservation restriction to be recorded, especially given the vote of town meeting. That's my guess. I can't, I can't really be certain of, of why that would, wasn't ever recorded there, but it is advisable that we do that with that parcel and any other parcel that we think uh, is, is, cons is conservation land, but not clearly coming up in a deed search, a title thank, search. Thank you. And given that, I mean, I, I will support the table for the reasons I, I said. I'm still very, very, very skeptical about this. and. Um, you know, unless we have some really strong answers and something to, to sway me next time, I would expect that I, that I would be, you know, voting no action if given the opportunity the next time, but but uh, potentially also including that voter request that the town council explore the recording of the deed. You have to come to the microphone. That's a question. Thank you. It's a quick question. What is the process for ensuring that that goes through? The deed is updated. I just don't want to leave any. That's what we're going to try to find out. Okay, That's perfect. That's why we're moving to table it. We're going to look at what does the housing authority well, opinion even besides on this the... and what we can do and what we should do in terms of clearing up that deed. Right. I mean, regardless of the Arlington Housing Authority, it's so the, for we, my concern. We can't is tell certainly. you that now, but yeah. that's why we're tabling it so okay. everybody else that will be done. Or that I, will be invested. I'm sorry. Can I just make one other point? Is that nobody should be in a panic about this because town land can't get sold without town meeting. So nobody's going to go and, and put in a proposal to sell all 10.7 acres of yeah. Mount Gilboa tomorrow. We, we can't. The only thing that's on the table, and I'm not saying this to be to squash conversation about this, but the only thing that's on the table is the one and a half, uh, 1.75 acre parcel that is one Mount Gilboa. Okay. So there's that nothing helps. else that can be changed right now. We should record it. Yes. We will Thank for you. all the other parcels, but absent town meeting voting to, to get rid of Mount Gilboa, we're Thank not going to do it. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Um, I, I actually don't have much interest in voting the table. It. Um, I, I'm, I'm, you know, willing to vote no action now, and I'm going to be voting no action at the next meeting, um, regardless. And I, I don't think that the issue here. Um, I, I think one, two things come to mind in, in this discussion. One is that we're already at 1.5, and two, I, I don't think that um, we, we should have be having an argument about adding more to it tonight. We should be. To, uh, devoting our efforts into getting DHCD to actually do their job and realize that that one point that that uh, land area over 1.5 is valid because they actually just are not doing that and they, they they don't seem to be really doing that in any community and kind of accepting it at at the current time. So I, I think that this is really a, a misguided approach to stopping the 40B. We should be working with. Um, the state, which I know we are uh, through the town council and our outside council. And I think that's where we should be devo devoting our efforts, not really, you know, creating schisms in town um, over two important groups that, um, you know, I think that we all agree it's um, each are equally important. Um, so that's that's where I'm at right now. And um, so whether I'm voting no action tonight or, you know, next time, uh, that's where I'm, that's what I'm going to do. John, I'm going to allow you a minute. Then I'm speaking. We probably wouldn't be here this evening and you wouldn't have this article and there's no one here from planning. That's the issue. They're the keepers of the records. You know, I've already found out there's pieces missing. We had the Arlington Corporation here speaking. I've lost a piece of property and maybe two pieces of property. Again, the proper paper didn't go forward. This was property that you paid for or you initiated with community block grant money. I want to see that protected. If we can get planning to commit to taking all the information I've sent them, which seems to go into a black hole, that balances these numbers and we can get those answers, I want to see Gilboa protected. And I've already given you the lead in that it hasn't happened because past mistakes. So there were, there's your decisions to be made. <laughs> Right. Mr. Chapdelaine. I'm, so, I, I'm sorry. Uh, with Did all, say I was going to go next? <laughs> I'm sorry. I, w with all due respect to Mr. Belskis, I can't let him besmirch the planning department in that regard. Every piece of information that Mr. Belskis has provided to both town council and I has been, if appropriate, included in the 1.5% calculation. So I, I can't stand by that remark. Can I go now? Mr. Gr Mr. Uh, Chairman? I pass. No. Oh. Uh, no. Uh, first, I mean, Mr. Belskis has deserves a medal for 
uh, what he has dedicated himself to for years. But I am absolutely opposed to this Warren article uh, in any way, shape, or form. So I would absolutely want to go for no action right now. But out of respect for two colleagues who feel they, they want to wait and to gather more information, but I, 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 I will lie on the ground in front of a bulldozer before we let anything happen there. Uh, we have to protect what open rights. <laughs> there are those that would like to be driving that bulldozer for <laughs> uh, But no, but you know, I, I understand you're just looking for, and so let's. Well, the two issues, right. including it's not recorded correctly and you all not protected. Right, but it, it, with it not recorded correctly. Well, I'll let him. But, but with it not, it screams for us then not to support this at this point. We have to take care of this first in my opinion, before we'd ever make any changes up there. So, I mean, I... I, I know. Town Council right. made a good argument for what you want, but I didn't ask you for can. it. I'd like to... You can. Just, oh. uh, so just a point. Doesn't it also fall under the Historic uh, District Commission uh, purview? So they would have to also decide on the House because it is part the of... The House. The House. So it, it would have some restrictions as well as to oh. what you could do. Right. So mm -hmm. yes. another layer that I just thought... Right. No, you're right. Yes, sir. So, uh, go ahead, you come no. on. One of you no, no. say something. Please, on. please. Uncle, Uncle. Yeah, come on. Please. I'm fine. I'm fine. Right. Please. please. So we have, we are done on this. <laughs> we have the uh, motion to table, which has been seconded. All those in favor of tabling, please signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, nay. aye. Nay. So, okay. Given that, it's a 2-2, two -two. what happens? Status, I move no action, Mr. Sta status quo, right? Status quo means it's not approved. That's right. So either way. So I'll, so I'll move no action. Okay, so he's going to move no action. Second. Second. Do you want to say anything? No, I just, I really feel very disrespected um, personally, as well as with the previous article um, concerning all the people with the tree community um, that I probably would have voted no action, but it's a very strong constituency that you all have, and I, I, at the very least, but am used to not being afforded the same opportunity um, to take the same case scenario, case in point, and have the same process. So I just wanted to make that uh, statement, and I'm really disappointed that town council, unfortunately, you know, gave his um, discussion um, that in my opinion, led to the fact that I'm, I'm once again not afforded the same opportunity. So, um, and I'll do my best in the future to work with my colleagues that you afford me the same opportunity that I afford you all, as well as the people who support you. Well, I believe you've had the same opportunity. My position is I'm against this, so I vote for I'm no not, action. Okay, okay. That's all I'm saying, okay? So we do now have a new uh, motion on the table for no action. Uh, seconded by Mr. Byrne. Yes. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed. Abstain. Abstain. So three, zero, and one. Good night, Uncle Bower. <laughs> Article 33, revolving funds. This is this is a routine, right, Mr. Chapter Lane? Yeah, I. I have to apologize. There was a. Oh, I'll, all right, quietly though, quietly. Yo, yo, hello. We're still going. Please, hello. Please wait till you're in the hallway. Okay, Mr. Chapter Line. I, I apologize, Mr. Chairman. All the materials are prepared, but there was a miscommunication between myself and the comptroller, and they didn't find their way into Nova's agenda. So we'll have to slip to the April 4th meeting. I'm sorry about that. Can I try move to table again? Yeah, go ahead. Second. Further discussion? No. Well, sorry, uh, what, what are we on? Oh, sorry, we're on revolving funds, but we don't have the info in front of us, so he's asked us to ta table. Thank you. All right, all those in favor of tabling, please signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed. Uh, next is Article 59. Uh, hold on one second. Uh, Article 59, Resolution, Handicap Parking Spaces, to see if the town will resolve to support policies that encourage the inclusion and designation of at least 5% and no more than 10% overall handicap parking spaces in any on-street 
public parking located in any business district B12345 so as to facilitate access for people with disabilities or take any action related thereto. Good evening. Good evening. First Thank you all, for waiting so long. I, I, I should tell you one caveat. I had said to someone a couple of days ago, I'd love to run for selectman, and <laughs> I've changed my mind. <laughs> <laughs> You know, it's anyway. funny, so have I. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, good evening. I'm Cynthia DeAngelis, and with me tonight presenting is Darcy Devney, <coughs> and Adam Karelski is going to help with our visual mapping. We are the working subcommittee representing the Disability Commission and submitting this warrant article before you that establishes a standard of 5 to 10 percent handicapped parking spaces in the business district of Arlington, Massachusetts. Our vision for doing this is one of inclusion and accessibility for our, com for our community, as well as for visitors and for our elderly population, which I learned today is called the silver tsunami. I did not know that before. <laughs> anyway, Darcy will um, review for you all the data that was collected and researched for this proposal. I do have to just make a note that um, it really took about 100 hours. You probably figured that out when you read it. But we did speak with everybody in town. Um, I know that's important to you all. I've been hearing that through all of these. Um, we poured over maps. We went through state data. We went through the town data. Um, we consulted with every stakeholder we could find. And hopefully this has been, it took a little bit of a village to get this proposal in front of you. So Darcy. I was nervous, but now I'm just exhausted. <laughs> <laughs> okay, data. Thank you, Adam, who's been doing the, did the map tool specifically for us, so we could show everybody this. I don't know if everybody can see, that's the website address. You can go to it yourself if you wanna look at it on your smartphone or something. So, first, let's document the need for handicapped parking. In Massachusetts, just under 10% of licensed drivers have handicapped parking parking placards or plates. The Census Bureau estimate in 2013 for ambulatory disabilities in Massachusetts, 6.2% and rising because of that silver tsunami we just talked about. Of Arlington residents 65 years and older, 16% have an ambulatory difficulty. So then we said, okay, but handicapped placards go with a person who goes with a car. So there are approximately 35,000 cars registered in Arlington. That's how many excise bills we send out. And there are about 2,400 active handicap placards in Arlington as of January 2015. So that makes 6.9% of the cars. Part of the reason the Disability Commission did this is because you may have noticed in the Vision 2020 survey in 2015, the Disability Commission got a a whole page of questions they could ask, and one of the questions they were asking was about handicapped parking access. Specifically, if any members of your household use HP parking in Arlington in the past year, how often could accessible parking be found in different areas? Didn't matter what neighborhood it was, East Arlington, Arlington Center, Arlington Heights, at least 27% answered that they could never find an HP space on street or in parking lots, which is a huge percentage. How many respondents were there? Oh, well, I knew you were going to ask me that, and it's over in my book. No, um, don't, don't worry about it. it I should can be, get it later. It might be on your page in your packet okay. that we included. I'm just not sure. Um, so, so 27%. So we said, okay, why is that? So we started counting. If you count in the general area of the business districts of Arlington, which is almost all of Mass Ave, we went from Trader Joe's in the Heights right down to the Cambridge line. That's all Massachusetts. Ave, then there's some right around the center, you know, because that is the business center there. We're gonna kind of ignore this lower part of Broadway in our calculations right now because if you put it in, in terms of street space, we would never ever get a decent percentage of handicapped parking. So, it's almost all of, um, it is all of Mass Ave. If you add that all up, both sides of the street, it's about seven miles of street. And the supply of HP spaces in that is totally inadequate to the need we found 23 handicapped parking spaces out of more than 1,000 on-street public parking spaces. So that is a 2.3% percent, percent, percentage. And um, Adam is going to show you, I hope, <laughs> does yeah. it work? Um, that's what they are. The blue ones are all the current handicapped parking spaces 
throughout Arlington. So we have mapped all of them, but there's only 23 of them in the whole town. So we're not talking residential. I want to emphasize it's all just business spaces. So if parking seems scarce for you when one in 35 cars can find a parking space in the business districts, imagine you're a person with an HP placard, you have a one in 100 chance of finding because 35,000 cars, et cetera. Okay, so this is an aspirational article, a resolution, and that's because uh, the ADA laws don't cover on-street parking specifically, but the Massachusetts Office of Disability does say they recommend a minimum of 5% handicapped paces, spaces for public on-street parking. And we have 2.3%. So we said, okay, what if we took it up to five, what would it look like? So we went over the map, section by section, curb cut by curb cut, and tried to find the best plan of how to arrange them, what it might look like at 5%. So if you add 27 total on-street handicapped parking spaces, the 18 primary spots, are gonna show up in red, and those are the urgent ones that really, really we gotta have. And nine secondary spots, which we also really need to even get up to barely 5%. Those are the ones that are showing up in orange. So that's the minimum it would take just to get us to 5%. And we should be doing better than that because of those statistics we read to you earlier where we're over 6%, we're over 7%, et cetera. You read the placement specifics. It's very complicated and you have to go through each space, kind of each, each block of cars is different. Um, and your criteria include curb cuts, nature and accessibility of the businesses. So we went through address by address and saw what those businesses were. Did they have takeout? Did they have delivery? Did they tend to have a lot of handicapped people or elderly people? Winter and plowing and bump outs, overhangs because the, the vans, handicapped vans for trees and lights, bus stops because you can't have one at a bus stop, and especially in the new East Arlington project, the street furniture, because people have to be able to get their walkers out onto the curb. Um, so out of all of these, there are some very easy, low budget ones. So nine of those right away could be done by doing nothing but putting up one blue sign, because there's already a pole right there so you don't actually have to paint the curb blue. You don't actually have to paint the pavement blue. So that's nine of them that could go in, you know, well, Mike might not say tomorrow, but he would say that it would be probably fairly easy. And some of them are a little more complicated. So we've shown you that there are only 2.3% on-street handicapped spaces in the business district of Arlington. We've shown you that we need at least 5% because we need that for our population. This map is our proposal to add the 27 streets at a minimum to achieve that better access for people with disabilities. So Cynthia is gonna talk about the outreach that we did to try and confirm that these are the optimal placements. First of all, we wanna assure you that we really wanted this to be a transparent, and I'm glad that we get to tell you that we talked to everybody. So um, it was outreach, inclusiveness, and transparency. So we did enlist the help of the Arlington, all the Disability Commission members, the Mass Office of Disability, community volunteers, specifically Darcy's whole family did this whole research, um, the GIS director, the economic planning, town council, town meeting moderator, Michael from the DPW, who really drilled us and grilled us several times on, the, on perspective and really got us to think about things a little differently. The editor of the Arlington Advocate and the town support staff, namely Marie, who I was going to cite as the phenomenal resource who kept pointing us in the right direction. Um, additionally, uh, we, do have a, we did have a detailed schedule of what we were gonna do, so we got um, several articles in the local newspaper for folks to be able to read it. We had um, emailing, of all local businesses. Um, we are also planning, so what we did is we're, we've divided up Mass Ave in three sections and we're going to walk it. And we're actually going to tell the business owners that we're coming so that they can come out and talk to us about where we're thinking of putting it. But we also feel like we have to have eyes and feet on the ground because I've been walking it the last couple of weeks from just about, I've only done the Bishop School to the end of, by Cambridge. So I've done that about four times. And what I found is 
where we, where we thought we could put spaces sometimes, we can't because there's either a bench now or a planter or a light pole, especially down in the East Arlington section. So what we want to do is walk it as well. Um, this was our best laid plan. We, we laid out all the maps, we met with everybody, and we put them where we thought. Now we have to do that second tier, which is to make sure that we talk to all the business owners and make sure, I have talked to, I'd say six to 10 so far. People have given us, some have said, yes, I want a handicapped space in front of mine. Um, other people say, we're takeout all day. So if you put one in front of mine, my truck can't come in. So those are the perspectives that we're not going to know unless we actually talk to business owners and do the walk. So hopefully, we have succeeded in reflecting the great need for you to support our warrant to increase handicapped spaces in our community. And this helps you as a committee to make an informed decision this evening. Um, you are the parking commissioners for the town, I'm told. So we thank you for your time and consideration, and hopefully we did it in eight minutes. <laughs> uh, a couple of questions? Yes, yes please. So, I'm, I'm kind of colorblind. So yes. I am curious. He is colorblind. <laughs> Let me give you, sorry, the big version. No, no, well, no. That one, those are colors, right? <laughs> He's not size blind. He's like, <laughs> no, no, I know, I don't want you to. No, just let me tell you my question, which is, I'm curious whether it was East Arlington better than other sections of town, since that's the one we've just redone recently. Um, no. No. no, actually, it's worse. She's been contacting us about that, yes. It's, it's actually um, a little bit worse. There's a whole section by, I want to say it's 190 Mass Ave, where the bank is in the building, that whole section has no handicapped parking at all anymore. In fact, that's one of the things that happened at our commission meeting was the, um, I'm going to forget now, it's a vision optometry or something. He actually came to us and said, I need my handicapped parking space back because we have folks that can't. Um, yeah, you Arlington know, Vision Care. Yeah, yeah, Arlington Vision Care. So he to. actually came in several times, and I went down and checked it out with him, and we, lo and behold, he doesn't have one anymore. So um, that's the kind of thing we're trying to work out right now. So. Do you think there was one in front of Arlington Vision, Vision Care? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Or one in front of the CSN. Right. It was like shared. It's like uh, half right. and half. No, you know what I mean? There, yes. People okay. East Arlington, yes. right? Because uh, well, just excellent work and whatever we can do. And I, I want to confess, I, I have a handicap placard, but I would tell you, I would say 50% of the time I am able to find a space. So you said. Your people said never. Uh, Twenty-seven percent. But it was actually twenty-seven to thirty-one. When someone is in there. I'll tell you that. We took the lowest the number, but it was twenty-seven to thirty-one percent came in as the data. And said never. It said never. Yeah. Okay. Anyhow, I bet I'm with you. Whatever you want us to do. <laughs> no, Thank I'm, you. because I'm now living it. I, I'm I know. Really tough on me walking, and I, mm -hmm. you know, I, I, I love it. It's the only benefit of my handicap. It's handicapped spaces. So throw in some more, please. I'm out, I'm out, I, I probably took the one you two might have been looking for tonight out front here. So. But does that mean you're going to vote yes? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I will affirm the importance Thank you. of this. Yes. Uh, okay, Ms. Mahan. I don't know. We'll see. Oh, yeah, Ms. Mahan. Nope. I, 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 if ever, why don't I stop? Because I was going to make a motion, but I think we need to hammer. Oh, questions? Oh, I, I was just going to say, I mean, thank you for this. I mean, you, you have been sitting, you've been listening to us all night. I think you saw us hang up on the rocky shoals of a couple of uh, other articles where we felt that maybe there hadn't been enough outreach and, and consultation with stakeholders in the community. And clearly, you've done that. I know you've done that because I met with the. Uh, uh, you know, some of the merchants in the center over the Chamber of Commerce, they had been, they had been, had this right on their agenda because you had reached out to them, yeah. which I think was, is very important. So, um, you know, as you know, I mean, this is a resolution. We, we ultimately make the decision, but I really like the process that you've outlined um, and the materials that you've given us as, as to how things would be surveyed, assessed, brought back to us, and then, and then brought forward. Thank you. I just had one question, and I, uh, Darcy, I think you actually answered it in your speech, but I missed it, the, which was, um, I wanted to know how you came to the 5%, and you listed a state agency or something that recommended, well, who was that? The Massachusetts. Massachusetts. Office of Disability recommends a minimum of 5%. Okay. 
In fact, um, they've been trying to, uh, what's the word, revise the ADA for years now <laughs> to try and get it to okay. cover the on-the-street parking spaces as well because it says you should have them, but it specifies no number whatsoever. Um, okay. So they're still working on it, and the Massachusetts Architectural Access Board, is that right, and they, yeah. um, is, is communicating with the Massachusetts Office of Disability because sooner or later the state will probably do it. I think you've got a memo in there from Mike Rademacher who says that uh, uh, he also believes that the state will get around to it sometime. But you know, our theory is that this town meeting would be the time to do it because it could take another three or four or five years and the problem's just getting aging demographics, sadly. Not everybody old is disabled, but it does mean that our stats are kind of creeping up every year. Thank you. Okay. Yep. Ms. Mahan. Um, first, I want to move approval to the proposed resolution. And I just kind of want to piggyback on what um, Darcy said there um, in terms of uh, individuals with handicap um, placards. There's a very gro rapidly growing constituency of um, autism spectrum uh, children, young adults. And I always think of them as, as kids, even when they're in their 30s and 40s. Um, and if, if you've ever um, been in that situation, and I don't have a handicap placket or anything like that um, yet, <laughs> but um, if you you know you've ever been in that situation, um, sometimes it's the fear of going someplace, usually not a medical office, but you know a place of business and you have that handicap placard and you have someone perhaps, you know, who's afflicted, is healthy otherwise, but is very young and has a severe flight risk. And I can tell you sort of personally, the stress and burden that most other people would be like, I'm going to Toys R Us, I'm going to the supermarket, I'm gonna pick up my prescription. And you get there and adequate safe parking is not there for you. Um, you really go through the ringer. And so I, I don't mean to kind of Thank milk you. that one. No, but, but actually that gets me to a point that we didn't say, which is that our plan is when we finish to actually have this uploaded to the website for the town so that people will know where the spaces are so that they'll, they'll be able to kind of plan for themselves around um, what's accessible and what isn't for them. That's fantastic. So um, we're hoping I, to do that as well. I want to say... I want to say my right. right now favorite, Adam, that is fantastic because there are, you know, sometimes people hear things and like, who well, the heck? You have to plan. Who the heck is, no, I'm, who the heck is um, really going to use this? But people, um, and I'm not saying people who are over the age of 50 or 60, but I can tell you that constituency, you literally sit down for the most mundane trip that That's you funny. need to make. And to have some kind of information like that, that someone could go online and say, I need to do this. There's two or three different businesses, and oh my gosh, you know, right. this one has a spot and the other two don't. Um, I, I think that's fantastic, and it really will be utilized. And I thank you. And I, I'm sorry, Mr. Byrne. Mm -hmm. you had your hand. Um, yeah, I, I just want to note, and I'm uh, happy to support it, but I, I, I do want to note that this is a, a resolution. So these, you know, all the spots and all like the dots. The, that might not be implemented right away, and that's subject to change. So I, do, I wouldn't want to rush to put this online, but maybe no, after no, no, we no, no. go down the road and we decide where some where the spots are and where they're going to be, maybe that will go online. No, but this I would be our wanna, final. Yeah, I don't want right. to get too far ahead of ourselves tonight. Um, but yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. I just, yeah. Especially with folks that have um, children with wheelchairs. Mm -hmm and they need to get to a specific place, they plan. Yeah, of course. You that know, they have to sense. go and either take a, take a trip there themselves first to see, okay, where am I gonna be able to park or how am I gonna navigate this? And what time am I gonna go? Exactly. <laughs> so, so uh, and I'm glad that you're gonna do this walking it and talking to business owners and yep. really identifying where, where these can go. But I am curious whether or not, or what, if there's a formula for our public lots. So for example, how many handicapped spaces should we have in the Russell Commons? Uh, I, I didn't mean to make you answer. <laughs> I, 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 I she has it right there. Study. <laughs> <laughs> but apparently she's ready to answer me, but. Uh. Yes, I am. <laughs> um, Arlington, East Arlington has no. Yeah, sorry. East Arlington has no off-street public lots um, at all. So 
you, there's none to put it in, sort of. Uh, oh, Arling well, there is behind the, that bank and the, on that block. It doesn't necessarily count as public. Oh, okay. That's the thing. That's the bank. That's um, so I you can't think park there to go to the optometrist. Right. You can only go. There. Right. You can only park there to or use the, the bank. apartments. Supposedly. No, 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 no. Oh, I've gone to the optometrist frequently from Shh. that lot. <laughs> no, it. There's a sign that oh, says oh, oh, Kevin. I'm telling you. And um, Arlington. Wait, wait. We got to change that. All those in favor. <laughs> it's yeah, private. No, sorry, private. Sorry, go ahead. Arlington <laughs> Center. You know, they did the two parking studies, Tack and and uh, Nelson Nygaard which didn't exactly agree on their counting, but close enough. It was about 500 on street, 11 or HP, and then off street, there's 13. So, and Arlington Heights, well, well, there's nothing. From, from the Mill Street on, the only okay. off street parking, public parking that's handicapped is the three spaces at the Arlington High School which doesn't really count because either you're at the high school or that's too far for you from anywhere else. Okay. So, yeah, thank you. so we would try, you know, it'd be great if we had the five to 10%. That's one of the reasons why we said five to 10% is that there are clearly places where they need to be more concentrated, like right in the center, <coughs> places where you can be a little more sprinkly about them and just put them in front of the business blocks as opposed to the residential blocks. Right, but so. you're coming back with that too. Right? Yeah. Yes. With the on street, with the off street? No, the on street. Say it again. I'm sorry. We're moving forward. Yeah. Yes. We're. Yeah. She explained how you're going to walk Mass Avenue and talk to the yep. business owners mm -hmm. and and identify specifically where spaces should go. Yes. Right. right. Well, yes. what we're hoping to do is show them what we're proposing. Right. And then hear from them their perspective. Right. Because you don't know what you don't know unless you see it. A but you also said you have to make sure. Is there a planter there? Is there a tree there? You exactly. Know? Right. So, okay. I think we're all set. On the motion by Mrs. Mahan. Seconded by Mr. Byrne? Yeah, sure. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed. I don't, we just haven't gone this long in a while. So, final votes and comments. Articles for review 21, 23, and 60. Is there a motion to approve? So moved. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed. Correspondence received. Move receipt. Move receipt. Is there a second? Second. Discussion? Uh, oh. Do we want to, where do we want to send no parking here to corner? Say again? No parking here to corner. Oh, right. Uh, I think at, 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 go to the is, parking is, subcommittee. Oh, does or it go to Corey? I, I, oh, to Corey, Corey. I say yes, if you not to yeah. Corey. That's okay. Right. Yes. Okay. You want. So moved. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 For Corey, the other two, move your seat. Somebody, anybody? Yeah. So, so move your seat. Second. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed. We, ha we have to do new business because we do need to hold an executive session. So let's get new business out of the way before. An executive session is just for the purpose of uh, um, releasing minutes from other executive sessions. So it should be very quick. Marie, new business. Just nothing. You can talk about Thursday night you want. Sorry? For the rehearsal. Are you going to talk about the rehearsal party Thursday night downstairs? Not okay. Well. Is anyone going to go? No. Oh, all right. I sorry. Well, I don't, uh, all right. This is for Joe knows about it. Right. I, I'm sure Stephen's home will be there, but oh, okay. I don't think Diane and Dan are singing with us, although they're always welcome. Doug? No new business, Mr. Chairman. I'll pass. Sure? I'll pass. God love you. You Stephen? sure? You have nothing else to say? Uh, 10.50, no new business. <laughs> Oh, only because I have to. I was down at the, as you all know, the basketball banquet for the freshman JV varsity boys basketball team. Um, fantastic season, and I just want to congratulate um, Clark Ewing, Ewan, um, who received the Paul J. Leone um, scholarship and award. Um, something that we're all very uh, familiar with, and um, one of the things that uh, a request that was made, and I said I would first speak with the chairman, and he can perhaps speak with the town manager, um, or I'm not sure if it's the treasurer, but um, in terms of getting the Paul J. Leone um, award sort of more status, and I have to find out exactly what John Leone meant about that. Um, so I don't know if it's a town request or a school, but um, that, that was a congratulations to Clark and, and the, the team for their season. Okay. 
Great, thank you, Mr. Kiro. Uh, just, just, just one. I just want to acknowledge that, uh, barring an emergency, I believe this is your last meeting uh, chairing this board before we reorganize, and so we Holy want to smokes. thank you for your uh, you. your service once again <laughs> with the gavel, uh, ending it in a marathon session, and um, good luck. We look forward to seeing you back here next year. Thank you, Joe. He doesn't want to give <laughs> the gavel up. That's why. <laughs> thank God decided it's his last yet. We may week. change the rules. I don't know. <laughs> I don't, after the job I did tonight, I don't blame you for wanting to be rid of me, Dan. <laughs> Nothing. Uh, so I'm sorry, I got three quick ones. First of all, so we got the Board of Selectmen Handbook, friends. So uh, very great, fitting for your last meeting, Mr. Great Chair. Great debt of thanks to um, I've been through it before, but all of the people that helped us. So we're recommending we put them right in our drawers, and now we have them all uh, to refer to. And as Joe points out already, you know potentially we have changes we're going to have to make to it. It's good. Uh, really Secondly, I was very proud yesterday to compete in the Arlington Education Foundation's <laughs> Trivia Bee Contest with Mr. Adam Chapdelaine and Mr. Joe, uh, Captain Mr. Joe Curo. But here's an interesting piece of trivia for you. So it was, there were things like uh, science, <laughs> sports, history, right? Facts about Arlington. Not our group, but another group that was up was asked this question. Five teams, all right, of three individuals each. How many members are on the Arlington Board of Selectmen? Oh, wow. Here are Too your answers. many. Here are your answers. Nine, seven, six, and two of them got it right at saying five. Is that phenomenal? They think we do the work of nine people, Mr. Grilly. <laughs> 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 well, we talk, we talk as much as nine people. Right. Okay, then the final thing I have before executive session is Adam's evaluations. You all got them to hand to me? Oh, shoot. No, no, I sent it to you via email. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah. So would Marie also have that? I didn't copy her. I sent it directly to you. Okay. Today? Last night. Okay. So I just haven't seen it yet. Okay. So. <laughs> I'll tell you why when we're off the mic because I don't want to. Yeah, no problem. So let me ask you, though, if you would get him to Marie as soon as possible. But, well, yes, I will do that. But or no, to I me, I guess to me because I have to get them right. to. I have to get them to Karen. Right. So I guess electronically is fine. How did you do that? Um, you when you go into the PDF, you something? say edit and sign, and it'll let you edit um, the PDF. Okay. All right, so that's it for me for new business. I'd like to make a motion. We go into executive session for the purposes of uh, discussing and or approving. Oh, yeah, just but, oh, I didn't even, I'm sorry. To review and approve executive session minutes for February 4th, 2016 and February 10th, 2016, meetings of the Board of Selectmen, and to release such prior executive session minutes pursuant to Mass General Laws Chapter 38, Section 22F, as appropriate. And when we come out, it'll be for the purposes of taking a final vote. Is that right, Doug? Sure, yes, yes. Um, so moved? Second. Yeah, Marie? Yes. 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 Okay. Uh, say what? I'd like to make a motion. Oh, sorry. No, that's right. So we're now back at the uh, March 21st, 2016 meeting of the Board of Selectmen. We have just come out of executive session. Uh, Vice Chairman Mahan, what's up? I'd like to uh, move that we release uh, the executive session minutes of February 4th, 2016 and February, is it 10th? Yes. Yeah, 10th. 10th. I'm doing it by memory from 2016. Um, for public release. Is there a second? Second. Further discussion? All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed? Move to adjourn. Move to adjourn. Second. second. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Next meeting of the Board of Selectmen, April 4th. Good night, Arlington.